Welcome to this week's episode of Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters, the show where we chart the cinematic legacy of the great classic monsters. I'm John Campbell. With me as always, Brendan Jones. Hello, listeners. Hello, John. Brendan. Uh, we're, uh, we're continuing our way through the Hammer films. And uh, this week, another one-off. We're sort of in a, a little track of one-off movies here before we get back into our normal uh, Hammer franchises. But uh, th- this is the one-off we're going to see again and again as a one-off in everything we're doing. And that is The Phantom of the Opera. I'm going to do the whole thing. <laughs> uh this movie could have used a little andrew lloyd weber um yeah i i mean i'm not uh, it, honestly any version we watch is always gonna pale to that because that was to me the f- the first phantom but also <laughs> the yeah i know i'm a i'm a young man um but also like the definitive phantom that's what i think of when i hear phantom of the opera it is strange i think i brought this up or or probably did when we talked about universal's phantom is that weirdly where a lot of these in my estimation go wrong and by that i mean filmic adaptations of this material um the only ones that have really been very successful or not filmic necessarily but adaptations are the original silent film Mm -hmm. and lloyd weber's musical which mock it all you like for its its datedness um it is this one, uh, that musical and the silent film are the closest anyone got to the actual source material. Everyone after, every single version, including this one, they they seem to like go, eh, loosely based on, we've got our own ideas. And almost always, those ideas are not great or they're not worth well, that's, the Well, that's the key there. I don't care if they want to deviate from the source material, but do something interesting then. Well, yeah, if you really have a new great idea, yeah. then make it work. But but it's so strange how many of these adaptations start to refer to other adaptations instead of the original source material. The original source material, Eric the Phantom, is born a tragic freak, but he's a genius, and he's a twist. his mind becomes twisted yeah. from a lifetime of hiding his horrible face and all this stuff, and, and he's basically a mutant. If right. you want to talk comics, yeah. that's the mutant origin. Um, whereas <laughs> almost all the other ones, including Claude Rains, including today's Herbert Lom, they go the Two-Face route. Yes. Where um, he's been the Phantom for roughly, I don't know, a year. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of an accident, which half the time actually in these adaptations is his fault anyway. So tragically disfigured through his own This time, very you know, much passions. his fault in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and essentially uh, he's and they they always lean heavily on the pitiable romantic part of it and yes that is certainly part of the original as well but really let's not forget this this is a he is an anti-hero if if anything and he's a straight up cold-blooded killer and should be not this time uh, that you you can see his motivations i know not this time. Not this time, but, man. Um, this time mm-hmm. he's just sad. He's not even he's, romantic. He's really just pitiable. There's a little romantic, but not the same kind. And but he it backs is, off pretty quickly when that other guy shows him. He's like, no, 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 okay. <laughs> well, it's also a little like the Claude Rains thing where they 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 hit the um, paternal angle really yes. hard. Yeah, and that's not again. That's not that you're right. You can deviate from the source material, but mm-hmm. you have to do it well. You have to have a really good <laughs> I'm still looking slant. for a good movie. Uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, this 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 one I'm sure you have some background for us, but I will say and as we were talking about a little bit before we started recording here, this was a tough sit. A tough sit, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um I mean, I had my hammer... issues with last week's curse of the werewolf but this thing is like that if it never took off yeah this this uh uh i I think was well intentioned and i actually i think the the faults of this one also lie with one guy uh no (laughs) that's that's unfair it's not all this guy's fault but uh anthony hines the producer also wrote this Mm -hmm. just like he did last week's curse of the werewolf yeah and as a writer i'm not his biggest fan 
I, no, I, I, as you I, said last week, I miss Jimmy Sangster. And I was going to say it again this week. I really miss Jimmy Sangster. But, hey, he's trying to peddle his TV scripts around. So uh. <laughs> he's, he, yep, he's working on his Petticoat Junction pitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> not in 1962. No, he's not. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of background. Not, not, not a whole heck of a lot. And today, no factoids from the life of because we don't even have someone as as colorful as i mean herbert long's great but he's just not you at don't, all you don't have great, great stories from the life of herbert long <laughs> not not as such okay all right well here we go so there are two things that made this cinematic version of gaston larose phantom of the opera happen one as we've talked about before was hammer films distribution deal with universal which gave them remake rights to a trio of the American studios horror classics. The second factor was none other than Cary Grant. What? Uh-huh. Whoa. What the f- Didn't expect to hear his name come into any of this. No, you did not. And that was one of my favorite things I found out. Apparently in uh, 1960, uh, the movie legend had let it be known by hammer execs that he was in the mood to try something different. Ooh. He'd done Yes, he had done the romantic thriller thing quite successfully with Hitchcock for a few years. But now he was in the mood to try horror, a genre he he had never done. That's all producer Anthony Hines needed to hear before pounding out a loose adaptation of the classic gothic tale under his screenwriting uh, pseudonym of John Elder. Uh, He later claimed that he knew all along Grant would never actually make the picture but uh, oh, I take that with a big grain of salt. Cary I, I Grant just, in a Hammer movie. Can we I know. even? Oh, I know. I know. I was thinking it's, when you said that, I thought there's no way he would ever do anything like this. But apparently, maybe he had some inclination. He thought about it. And actually, oh. I think he dodged a bullet. I don't know. If well, yeah, script... not this movie, but just I would like to see him in a genre picture, though. I would like to see him in a horror film. I, yeah. I think along with Jimmy Stewart, Cary Grant could do anything. Yeah. And God, if but, you got Grant and Cushing in a movie together, oh goodness oh, gracious me! Could I the know. screen contain that? Uh, Archibald Leach, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, yeah, um, yeah. love that man. We'll talk him up uh, as much as we can right now because he's not ever going to be brought up again on the <laughs> show. <laughs> we will never speak of this man again. Um, huge Cary Grant fan, yeah. and we, this was a missed opportunity. Absolutely. If nothing else, it would have been great to see him. Yeah. Attempt horror. It would have been fun. I was just watching To Catch uh, a Thief the other day. So, oh, uh, To Catch a Thief, so great. Delightful. I mean, they're all great. Yeah, they're all great. Yep. Uh, he made some stinkers, but I mean, he always he's Teflon as well. He yep. always comes out as Cary Grant, yeah. and you go, "Well, sorry, Cary, that one wasn't such a winner." Even something like his you... last movie, Walk Don't Run. It's not very good, but damn, if he's not charming in it. Oh man, and we were talking about. Um, Gene Kelly earlier talk about a way to go out Xanadu the best <laughs> movie ever <laughs> going out on top oh, I remember seeing that just being like this was how what are you kidding me Kelly finished it up oh god uh that's our next podcast we're gonna do the Xanadu minute and uh, every episode will be a minute of Xanadu <laughs> they call it Xanadu I can only imagine the pain that would uh, on me it would be no problem I would be delighted because it's terrible but it yeah. is one of my guilty pleasures love mm. it you would be shooting your brains I out. I saw it the once, week. and I said, that is enough. Oh, it's the best. <laughs> Olivia Newton-John. Okay, anyway. Um, so, yes, Grant did indeed back out. Uh, and the lead of, did, they actually of the offer, film, did he actually read the script? Do we have any idea? We don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. I think he may have gotten cold feet even before the script was done. <laughs> I just like the idea of um, reading this being like, I'm not going to do this shit. Uh. I, I could easily see him reading the script and going, well... Not this one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but following in the footsteps of Lon Chaney and Claude Rains comes along Herbert Lom. A, a, he was last minute choice, by the way. Um, a Czech of Jewish descent. Lom, born, and this is where I take a deep breath, oh, God. and massacre a name. Yeah. Massacre a name. Herbert Charles Angelo Kuchachevic Zeschluden Pacheru. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at it on his IMDb. That's, yeah. Peter Pacheco uh, immigrated to the UK in 1939 to avoid the Nazi occupation of his country. Already a working film actor in his early 20s, he became an established and reliable character actor. <clears throat> and 
I love the guy. I love me some Herbert Lom. Um, you know, probably first familiar with him thanks to the Pink Panther films. Yeah, but same here. But you run across him in all kinds of stuff. He was a great heavy. He was always just a very magnetic presence. I I mean, love the guy. Spartacus, uh, Cronenberg's The Dead Zone. Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, every pretty much every reviewer points out that in this particular film, he was really game to jump in. Like uh, Anthony Hines himself said, this is unenviable. You're going to come in and replace possibly Cary Grant at the last minute big part I and do, he was like i do love the idea of it's Cary grant he says no herbert long yeah, yeah they, they you know cushing was busy lee was probably not going to be doing this um so they they jumped and herbert long said absolutely whatever faults this film has and there are plenty the reviewers always point out he's not one of them and i agree i, I, I think her as well he brings it it's just that what he's bringing that's not his fault yeah uh, he's <laughs> in though he's locked in Yes, even devoid of a slumming Hollywood icon like Cary Grant, Hammer did not scrimp on a uh, scrimp on this production. Its proposed budget of two hundred thousand pounds doubled during filming, making this one of the most expensive films the studio ever made. Sadly, although it was released on a double bill with their brand new Peter Cushing fun pirate smuggler film Captain Clegg, which was supposed to be Dr. Sin, but they couldn't get the rights, so they just changed the name, and it is a Dr. Sin movie. I like Captain um, Clegg. Yeah, Captain Clegg's fun, also known as The Night Creatures. Yeah, it's in the Doesn't same... I, I, the last few movies we've done have been in the same box set of mine that has oh, nice. Curse of the Werewolf, Brides of Dracula, Night. it's called Night Creatures on there. Yeah, um, all from the same little clump of time, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah, uh, because it's a universal box set, so I think it's what they have the rights to. Oh, yes, of course. Well, like I said, uh, even though it was released, they were both new releases. That was rare that they put out a double bill, not of here's the big A picture and here's something we've had for a while. They released two A pictures as a double bill, but it still flopped at the box office, making it a small scale disaster for the studio. And some people think this was the end of Great Hammer. And I'm like, well, we got some more fun stuff to come. we're, We're still at pretty early days, really. Well, Hammer had been around, but yeah. but and and we are not talking about everything Hammer has put out. Yeah, so they've true. also put out some really great stuff that we aren't talking about on this podcast. And some people think that this this big financial upset was that they never quite recovered from. Well, but, I, will, eh. I will say the double bill of this and Captain Clegg. Captain Clegg is going to play a lot better to an audience than this. You yeah, I mean? that's a lot more fun, fast paced. It is. Yeah, that, that and it's a, it. and then this is a slog. It's it's another great and very different character for Cushing to play, and yeah. he sinks his teeth into it. It's wonderful. Um, but as far as Phantom's uh, failure, were the audiences of the day just stupid, or were they on to something? John and I are here to weigh in on just that subject. We might have already I think tipped our hand, yeah. I think we have, and I got to say, uh, yeah. yeah. I had hopes that this would be... A misremembered because as a kid i remember thinking this was kind of boring yeah but i was like maybe i just wasn't ready for it and i watch it go no i was right at eight or whenever i saw it i remember liking but i think i only liked how the phantom looked <laughs> i don't think i really had any well i, I have some problems with that too I, there's, I still there's a lot like of decisions. how the phantom looks actually uh i like he's kind of monochromatic that yeah. they kind of did on purpose like his skin as is mottling so it's all kind of grayish I mean, his hair is white and his mask is a, almost the same tone of gray as his skin i i will say this is a low bar but it it sails well above claude rain's phantom look so you know kind of i kind of liked claude rain's mask claude rain's did have a cool mask but then when but, but the, the mask came off was it was not, like what yeah. okay it didn't seem that yeah bad. here this guy's fucked up <laughs> This guy's fucked up. Yeah, and it's true. That, that's a very, it's pretty good makeup on this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's uh, let's dive into it. Let's. I I bet you want to look at the movie poster. Well, I, because I want to talk about really the only great thing about this movie, which is I really like this poster a lot. And it is it, a good one, and it's another one that promises a movie you're not gonna see. <laughs> <laughs> You've got. I mean, the vast majority of the image is the Phantom riding atop this chandel this giant chandelier that appears to also be on fire 
Yeah. Uh, as it falls towards a panicked crowd of opera goers uh, with the chain snapping, you know, and uh, yeah. Guess what you don't, you, you don't get in this movie at all, that. No, you get a pretty lame chandelier fall mm-hmm. at the end of the mm-hmm. movie because you, you have to. It's just it's it, it goes hand in hand with the Phantom. Um, but uh, I just th- this image is very well painted. It's very evocative. It's very exciting. All things this movie is not. Um, it so, has an inset panel. It does have it's an not- inset panel. A little black and white image of uh, the Phantom carrying Christine and. The statement that which this is, is also something that doesn't happen. Nope. Well, because what this yeah he, he has he has his assistant do that. What yeah what this what this poster does not in any way indicate is the presence of his sidekick, um, which who's is the actual threat. And yeah, who's that's the real the thing villain? The Phantom is just kind of around. I'm not a fan of how that went. Nope. Anyway, no uh, no weird yes, decision. I, but it does I declare agree. this is the greatest thrill classic of all time. Yeah, the the lawsuit where the viewers actually rose up in mass, the class action lawsuit where they said no, this was not the greatest throw classic of all time, is yeah. what sunk the studio because <laughs> uh, the courts yeah. sided with well, the audience little, and said, as we're saying, you this lied. is obviously the last episode of our Hammer series. This is <laughs> they never came is back that... from this. Uh, no, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a cool poster. I really like the poster a lot, but unfortunately. No, it just it doesn't deliver on the movie. Let's look at some of the other taglines beyond the greatest thrill classic of all time. All these will promise a movie that we don't get. Um, yeah. We have the most unusual tale of terror and love ever told. Mm. No. I guess it's fairly unusual. Um, <laughs> beneath his mask... The grotesque face of horror, unimaginable. Inside his heart, the desperate desire for beauty and love. It really is trying to sell the dark romance of it, which isn't very present in this movie. The dark romance thing is one of the big slants of the story, but but it's not served at all by the script or this movie. Um, He hid behind a mask that was not his. Until her beauty stripped away his curtain of evil, his mask of horror. Man, what the? And just, then, yeah, just stop. Well, just th- stop already. This one's my favorite, though. Out of the hellfire of horror unimaginable rises the figure of terror incarnate. Wow! Wow! So none of these people saw the film before they oh, wrote their Lord, taglines? No. no, no, no. They're like, what? Phantom of the Opera? We got it. We know where this is going. <laughs> Out of the hellfire. <laughs> that poster Jesus. combined with that tagline, I'm going in with a very wrong idea of what this movie is. Shit on composer gets revenge? Yeah. Question mark. <laughs> Best tagline for it. Shit on composer gets revenge. Douchebag Alfred from Batman is, uh, you know, oh I gotta God. say, great villain. <laughs> oh, goth rules in this movie. I do. He's having a blast playing this part. He is twirling an invisible mustache <laughs> all the way through this he, thing. Anytime he's in the movie, I'm on board with this thing because he's just, you know, he. Th- there well, they, is no ceiling for him, where this guy's going. Um, that's exactly it. They gave him no redeeming quality whatsoever, <laughs> and you can just see. Michael Goff going, thank you. Yeah. I mean, he's just playing he's... an unrepentant bastard. Oh, yeah. He's lecherous. He's violent. He's just cruel to people. Uh, I mean, it is virtually him going up to, to you know, uh, poor children and kicking them down the street. <laughs> he's he's I almost was at that actually level. waiting for him to legitimately steal candy from a baby. <laughs> what is I'll that? Licorice? It? That looks delicious. It's mine. Yeah, oh Michael, Michael Goth is a real bright spot in this movie. Because um, oh. Lord knows the lead characters are boring as fuck. Oh, my and God. And I say, among, we'll talk about all the, some of the decisions that they made as far as changing the story or the source mm-hmm. makes sense on a 
on a practical financial level. Sure, sure. And then some things seem arbitrary, like the timeline where basically this whole thing happens in about a week. And I just sit there going, well, that's a mistake. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The opera ghost is really, uh, he gave us a little bit of trouble in the last couple of weeks. Is it really a ghost? Oh. I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll, and then, ta- we'll talk about the Phantom been, being a scamp early in this movie. Um, has he been, been training Christine since youth? No, she just met the guy talking in her in her uh, uh, dressing room uh, literally like five minutes ago. And uh, it takes like one date. And then she's calling the, the romantic lead by his first name despite class differences. And they're basically just going to hook up. That's, and uh, yeah, there's yeah. literally no conflict with their. Oh, well, we'll get into it here. Let's we will. Let's, so the movie does. The first thing we see in this movie is a chandelier, which I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, little Chekhov's gun here. Now, it is not the chandelier that will actually fall later in the movie, but it is no. a chandelier. It's a chandelier in an empty theater. And so that's how we start. And then we go to what I actually do think is a pretty cool set, which is the Phantom's Lair. It's a little bat cavey. I mean, oh, uh, small. I like the set. Yes. You know, but... And I, I thought, interesting choice, but I think that's Hammer like going, look, you're not going to get a lot of them, so we may as well kick it off, like, give you what you wanted. Here's some Phantom right off the bat. There's no mystery about how the Phantom will appear mm-hmm. or, you know, that kind of thing. We start the movie... In his lair with him pounding on those keys. Yeah, because it, it does this thing where it's going through the theater, no music, nothing, total silence, into the Phantom's lair. And then as soon as it hits the organ, we hard cut to his face in the mask real close. And it actually kind of made me jump a little bit. Uh, oh, it yeah. was a little startling. Well, it was just a loud sound and a sudden are, visual cut. Are, are you? Is everything okay at home, John? No. <laughs> No, no I, did, I did think that that was an interesting and pretty cool editing choice. Yeah. And the way they... There's a couple um, good, strong edits in this movie for, for horror I that I thought that, that were pretty... Because, I mean, we still have Terrence Fisher at the helm here. Yeah. Who knows and what he's doing. Then, yeah. He's, it's, 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 this is well-directed. This is uh, very similar to um, uh, Curse of the Werewolf. It's a kind of cool idea of, like, let's start the movie with a close-up of our monster's eyes. In this mm-hmm. case, monster's eye. Yeah. And so it's a pretty cool, as you say, jump edit kind of thing. And they're, you're close on the mask. And this phantom has one eye is patched over and mm-hmm. only one eye is visible. So as the credits roll, we just keep zooming Yeah. into yeah. the eye. So the eye is full, I filling the screen. every time we zoom. No, I didn't. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't get closer. Oh. No, back up. Uh, <laughs> uh, I never wanted to get that close to Herbert Long's eye. But I'm not to be fooled again after Curse of the Werewolf. I'm going, wait a minute. We're starting on the Phantom close up. Wait a minute. Is this another show me the monster? So I'll apparently forgive you that we don't see him for another 40 minutes. Not exactly. I, I actually no, think the, I actually think they, I think they do properly tease out the Phantom in this movie. Um, the way that they play it. I think it's fine. Uh, and I, I want to get, I, li- I mean, I like the idea. I like the idea that unlike the universal movie, we don't get a full 25 minute origin sequence for the phantom here. We do have, well, well, I have a big problem with this though, hmm. because we have a character tell us yeah, what happened to this guy yeah. who we find out is tree. Mm-hmm. Dr. Petrie, the composer or Professor Petrie or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, instead of Eric. A, a distant um, ancestor of Rob Petrie, the head writer of the Alan Brady show. Uh, right. As as reference in that classic Nick Van Dyke show episode where we see him playing the organ wildly yeah. uh, while wearing a mask. It's just in um, the blood. Uh. <laughs> but we have a character tell us the story. Yes. And then within maybe eight minutes of screen time, we're then going to see it enacted, and and oh, I didn't... quite at, at quite some length. And I was like, going, don't do that. No, I don't. Don't have you either have a character tell us a story, yeah, and we never see it, or we see the flashback, but you don't do both. I 100 percent agree with that. Early in the movie, I'm taking you through my thoughts as I'm going through the movie a little bit here. Oh uh, yes, I'm going. Yes, oh yes. good, we're gonna make it like a mystery, and I did sort of like the idea of it being a little bit of, you know, our main character has to do some detective work to figure out what 
is the deal with this phantom. I like that as opposed to once again, where I thought, God, it took forever for him to turn into the phantom in the Claude Rains version. However, then yes, they do go too hard into the origin down the stretch when you're like, we should be hitting the climax of the movie, not now doing extended. Th- I mean, it's, it's a similar thing with the mummy, right? Where you're just like, okay, I know we don't need all of this. I get it. it you know? And, and yep. yeah, it is like, cause I'm watching when that flashback happens, we'll get to it, but it is like, well, I know what he's going to do next because they already told me what he does. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, it, it, it's, uh, not, not the way I would have structured it, but this is one of the, instances of them kind of following the model of the book yay anthony hines because the book does try to as you know they want there to be something of a, a mystery aspect to it mm. so you come to it as a cynical observer who's seen several phantom of the opera movies or you know or read the book you're like we i know i know exactly blah 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 but i like a little bit of that too where i like to see how this weird figure is he real is he imagined yeah. is he supernatural is he human impacts normal people that's the whole point of the thing Well, because it's it's, it's is, like the dracula uh, movie later. too i don't want the characters to immediately be like this must be a vampire it's probably dracula you know like <laughs> exactly i want oh, to don't be worry like, i know how to fight draculas yeah. <laughs> oh i've i've run across a few draculas in my time um <laughs> uh, you know they're you, pretty they're pretty tough lou those draculas <laughs> you gotta oh goodness but um yeah where's blood yeah, abbott is... in this movie that really would have livened it up Ah, what am I doing here? I'm at the opera. 1961, uh, 62. Are either of them? I mean, they're both still alive, right? Uh, I think Lou is gone, but uh, uh, Bud is still alive. I just want to make okay, sure. an elderly Bud Abbott wandering into this movie. <laughs> yeah, Lou, Lou is gone, but uh, I'm almost certain um, that Bud is. Uh, uh, yes, Bud is with us till 1974. God, he could be in so many of these. <laughs> um, couldn't they have found some some fat little guy who could kind of run around as a bargain basement Lou? Uh, but anyway, um, it's me and Ross Stello. Uh, I, I will say that they start uh, uh, the the beats here at the beginning. I'm liking, except for the fact that it becomes immediately apparent. Oh, we're in London. Yeah. Uh, the time frame has moved up a little bit and we're not in Paris, mm-hmm. which I know that's a small thing, but the Phantom of the Opera is it's the, the Paris Opera House. You need all of that stuff. Plus the Paris Opera House really was built a, a, over a, an underground lake with all that stuff, which is where Gaston LaRue had that whole idea. Um, this theater, which is totally made up, isn't. And we're like, oh, so the Thames just kind of runs underneath. Okay, whatever. We'll I, I'm, I'm go with it. I, I'm not. That's not hitting anything for me. That, that, that that's fine. I'm to nitpicking. London. Yeah, John, I'm nitpicking. yeah. I know. I know. And and you're you're. I want my fan of French. Yeah. I want Christine to be Christine Daae. I don't want her to be Christine Charles or whatever her name is. Oh, I didn't. Christine even... Clark. Yeah. Yeah. They say her last name, and it's something. So it's like everybody has a literary Marvel Charles. comics names in this movie for some reason. That's kind of true. <laughs> I want Raul, yeah. the, the Vicomte not, de not Chagny. Harry? Not Harry. Harry, the pro- he's the producer of the show? Is that oh, man. Is? Plus, I kept wondering as I was watching this, has the person who's written this, a.k.a. producer Anthony Hines, ever known anything about how stage productions the, are? I, yeah. Because the producer here <laughs> and the, the theater manager yeah. are living in terror of the composer, of the guy who wrote the piece, like yeah. he, the guy who has all the power is the playwright yeah. composer. Yeah, not the people who run the theater. It, it actually it's, took me because how... uh, several times in I'm going, does he also own this theater? I know, <laughs> and the producer seems to be the director. Yes, oh, he definitely but, is. But then other Harry, times, when... other times, it seems like the composer's directing. Jesus, man! <laughs> and then there's another yeah. guy who I don't know what he's up to. Um, well, no, the that, manager. That, that's the theater manager who does yeah. talk about the owner that we never meet. Like, oh, the owner won't be won't like to hear about this. And I'm like, going, why are you guys in fear of basically but the talent? That leads me to the, inter- the the next scene that we the first scene we cut to here is Michael Goth standing in the uh, lobby of the opera house. Uh, he, he's he's playing uh, uh, Darcy. Uh, right. It's uh, Lord Ambrose Darcy. 
Um, Art Ambrose Darcy, who's apparently the wunderkind of of not opera because this is his first opera, but he is a composer of some note. But but not knowing where this movie's going or who these characters are, we see um Thorley Walters as Latimer come up to him and yeah, say something. The theater manager and, yeah, he's the theater manager and and Darcy says this play, this opera, better go off without a hitch. I tell you, and I and immediately I go, okay, so he owns the theater. No, yeah. that's not the case. No. Then later, when they call him the composer, I was like, wait a minute, what? Who is he? Because just the way he's like looking around at the people and going like, yes, yes, come over here. We need to make sure this night goes off without a hitch. I'm thinking, know, okay, it he's the man in sense. charge. He's the money is man. It? He's the financier at the very least. He's the guy. D- no, no, no. No, he's he's the composer, and that makes no yeah. sense. There also appear to I mean, just I, be three people in charge yes. of everything at this show. Like, yeah. <laughs> I uh, will say that Hammer they spent some money on extras and you casting. can see it in this. I mean, both but, we have a full house in the theater, but also all the people who are working backstage and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, aside from the people in charge of it, it does seem like a working theater, except for when it comes down to principal parts as far as speaking roles they really did here's where they 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 were very efficient yes they said no exactly as you say there are three people yeah <laughs> i mean um, similar to the dick van dyke show there are three <laughs> people writing that show every week <laughs> it's pretty amazing with a... with rob and and sally and and uh buddy buddy yeah i almost said maury i was like no yeah. that's maury. yeah maury amsterdam yeah life. um yeah, no, I was always just like, good God, that's insane. Uh, although I think the Larry Sanders show, they had two writers in the, in the so, you know, and, a, and occasionally somebody else maybe. Pretty amazing. Yeah. And Gary Shalin himself coming in and rewriting everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, yeah, I just wrote down, uh, immediately I was like, hello, Michael Goth, he's quite fancy here, isn't he? With his slick yeah. back hair and his tuxedo, decades before he's Alfred the Butler, but he'll always be Alfred the Butler to me. It doesn't matter. Um, I I know that he actually a lot of his parts when he was coming up were assholes. Mm. I love the fact that he could then, you know, he always had it in him. He's a fine actor, but Alfred is one of the warmest, yeah, and stablest, and you're like. That's that's an Alfred I I can get behind, and you're like going this guy, this yeah. guy here, yeah, Darcy. I know is a guy who uh, when Alfred he, when he ended up being a dick because he's not you know he's he's a heroic character. Last we saw him in Horror of Dracula, uh, that's true because he sort of becomes Van Helsing's sidekick in that movie. Um, yeah. Here and he see, wasn't being overcome with terror and yeah. gibbering and yeah he takes a hard turn into being a badass down the stretch there. Uh, <laughs> But uh, to su- when 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 we sort of see that he's an asshole in this, I was like, "Ooh, goth on the dark side." Yeah, because and he <laughs> yeah to me he is. I mean, I grew up loving those Tim Burton Batman movies, and to me he is just kindly caring Alfred Pennyworth. Um, apparently Alfred has cousins in the uh, in the in Old Blighty who are real dicks. Well, as you know from the comics, Alfred does have connections to the British theater scene. That's very true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so wait, now you work on your fan fiction in your own time, okay? <laughs> when you start co- combining these universes, but but he is great here. I mean, my the whole thing of novels is... about Alfred's acting days. Indeed. So he is, um, he's the dude in charge, or well, not in charge, but he seems to put I, the fear I, of God into everybody. I mean, at he this apparently theater. has the ability to fire the producer and the entire orchestra. And I mean, he's, he pretty much will fire everybody by the end of this movie. The, the production is his opera of uh, St. Joan. Yes. Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc story. Um, not traditionally, obviously, anything tied into Phantom of the Opera, but still, I'm like, Okay, fine. This is their token. This is going to be the opera, and we are introduced uh, backstage, right? We jump yes, to backstage, yes. and we're introduced to the star of this opera, Maria. who is Maria, an Italian woman, mm-hmm. um, and she's kind of a diva. As this is stock, this is what yeah. you want. 
Um, and she uh, is alone in her dressing room, and she gets a visit. Well, there's a from... cu- there's a couple ominous things that happen before that. We see her preparing. Oh, right. She's spraying something in her mouth. She's doing her vocal warm ups, and then we see backstage. We see the 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 stage hands once again raising the chandelier up into the air. I'm going like eh, that thing's gonna fall. Um, oh. And we see on the ropes of it, we just see the the, the mangled hand of the phantom. Uh, yeah. And then another guy, the orchestra is getting ready, and the guy goes to grab his drum, and the drum is the torn been apart. Ripped in. Yeah, yeah, it's been ripped and he's up. Like, what? What the what? And then we get there's there's a hand. We see a uh, we see a hand on the lamp in Maria's dressing room. Yeah. And she turns and then screams. Yeah, we don't see what she sees. Yeah. Uh, she screams. Oh, and actually, then... this is one of the good cuts. We see her, and as she turns, it hard cuts to a guy crashing his cymbals together. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I was yeah. like, ooh, the phantom murdered this lady. No, no, this phantom, not a murderer at all, so. Really not, which, again, that's like, a what sad. A, what a waste of a great cut, though. <laughs> what a waste of a great phantom. Yeah, because I'm, uh... like, I'm just like, that's, a, that's murder. <laughs> But the producer is now he's, is, he's he's just arrived at the show, but he sees the young of, and he's heroic. Yes, and and, and boring, first thing is the, man. Boring. And the conductor goes, "Hey, man, um, you should know something. Maria is freaking out in her dressing room, yeah. but also, uh, someone has stolen all my music. Yeah, all my goes, music's missing. He goes, don't worry, you know this backwards and forwards. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> dude, you can't." You can't go out there and just blind conduct it. Oh, oh, good. Whatever. So this is Edward D'Souza, who plays our heroic, uh, what's his Marvel Comics name? Harry Hunter. Harry Uh, Hunter. (laughs) Jesus. Um, But thanks to his IMDb, it leads me back into my favorite place to go on the show. It's time for 007 Corner. Yes. (laughs) Yes, this guy was in. (laughs) Yes, this guy was in a Bond movie. He's in 1977's The Spy Who Loved Me, one of my favorite Bond movies. And it is a good one. And he plays Sheikh Hussein. So, you oh, know. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, very appropriately cast there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> How much you want to bet they darkened his skin a little bit? Uh, from what little I remember of the character Sheikh Hussein, I believe they did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just just wanted to make sure that everything was just as awful as I remember. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. so yes, uh, he he's charming and young, and he's, he's like, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. I'll go check on Maria. Yeah. So he goes to check on Maria, and um, to, I, I, I know that I shouldn't read anything present day into these older films, but uh, she's like I, going, yeah. I saw a figure... Uh, it was a ghost, uh, all in black, with an eye in the middle of his forehead. And she goes, "You don't believe me?" He goes, "No, no, I, I, I well, believe you." She, she didn't <laughs> and I was say. Like, she doesn't say all in black. This is where I thought you were going. She says, "He was black, black oh, all no. over." And I was no, like, I, I, "Jesus!" Uh, about I was thinking more along the lines of uh, of of uh, believing the victim, because oh. you have oh, historical okay. woman. And I thought it was somewhat weirdly kind of progressive to have Harry. He doesn't poo-poo her. No. He's like, well, I'll figure out what it was that you saw, but I do believe you. I do believe you. And what you saw, I believe. And I'm like, wow, okay, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's, he's like, yeah, 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 right. And he even says, he's like, because she goes, I want to go. I don't want to go out on stage. And he says, oh, you're not going to let a silly thing like a ghost stop you from going out there. Yeah. And I did think, like, so we're just taking ghosts for granted in this thing, or he's just – placa- I guess he's a good producer. He's just placating the star and going, like, yeah. yes, we'll look for the ghost. You go out on we're stage. Gonna go, we're going to go look for the ghost. I'm going to call in your your uh, dresser lady, Teresa. She's yeah. going to look after you. And, uh, I'm going to call that- in the Ghostbusters. We'll have him sent over from New York. Venkman and the boys will come over. Uh, <laughs> the boys are back in town. Uh, and then uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, geez, that's, that that's be... what this movie really needs is a little Bill Murray, a little Dan Aykroyd, a little Harold Ramis, some it Ernie needs... Hudson. None of that could hurt. No. I mean, because literally, this... the, the, 
this cast is not uh, uh, Herbert Lom is good. Goth is good. Everybody else, though, I found pretty meh. It's kind of yeah, they're including not, our not, heroine. They're not bad per se, but no, they're all just sort of boring and. And actually, Maria, there's always they always cast someone with a lot of personality as this part, even though it's not always named Maria. This, this woman is way more interesting than the woman who plays Christine. Is what I'm saying is is what happens next in the story writes her out of the movie. Yeah, and I was like going. You know, most versions of this story where it's Carlotta, the diva, she doesn't leave immediately. In fact, she she fights back. She's like, yes. I'm still a huge ego, and I will not let this little mousy chorus girl take my parts. Yeah. She sticks around to spice things up until the Phantom has to actually kill her, you know, yeah. and, or get her out of the way. I, but in I, this I'll, movie... I'll give the Universal One don't... that. That Phantom took some lives. This Phantom I... is... a uh pacifist as far as i can tell <laughs> and maria basically gets this one more scene and that's it so what well, so we maria goes out on stage the show starts and as the show's starting we go up to the box where latimer and harry are and harry is talking shit about darcy he says oh it's really interesting how good this musical is considering how terrible darcy's taste in music is and of course at this exact moment Darcy yeah, has Darcy walked in. He's like, well, thanks for your uh, input there, Harry. He's overheard this and it's whole thing. It's a real thing. Uh, neck tightening gull moment. Uh, Harry handles it again. He's nothing if not smooth. He goes, "You're very welcome, Mister Darcy." Like, yeah, you heard me. Smack. I don't even care that you heard me because <laughs> I'm Harry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're paying attention, but I am the hero of this movie. Uh, and uh, is this where Darcy goes? I thought you said this was a sellout crowd. Yes. Why is that box empty? Yes. That's uh, it. Why is that box over there empty? And, and Latimer is just like, oh, that one. Yes. Nobody wants to go to that one. People say they hear voices and things over there. You know, it's it's it, it's it's bad. He's, and then, yeah, <laughs> Darcy's just like, are you telling me it's haunted? Well, yeah. that, and he's like, I'm not saying that, but that's what that's what people say. And then Darcy's like, screw that. You sell that box next time. I want to fall out. Darcy doesn't miss an opportunity in this film to be an asshole. No. Where he's like, going, I, I don't care if people don't want to sit there. I want to see a full house, including that box. There is nothing even, like, benign he does in this movie. It's all Hell. just mean. Yeah. He is bad. Yeah. And he doesn't, really, he doesn't really get it. Yeah, he really doesn't. No, he, he, I believe he faints at the end of this movie. He does not get murdered. Damn it! I know this because you want you, the whole the whole movie. I'm going. Oh, Goth's gonna get it the worst. No, but but you're really hampered by having a non-violent phantom. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's the bit that I, 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 this movie has a lot going against it. That's the single biggest sin this film commits. And yeah, if you ask me. Yeah, I I had uh, I had sort of underscored that when we were talking about it when we first started the season. I was saying. Yeah, they they I did remember that they had changed the core part of the phantom. Uh the phantom not really being responsible for the true evil. He is mysterious and he does he's trying to get his name, you know, uh his music recognized, but he's not he's not a killer. No. And it, they hand that off to another character who really doesn't get enough screen time to really register much. And, and in and fact, like, oh, later really? is actively said we know nothing about him. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes he gets loses control. He but... doesn't even have a name. I kept calling him Sidekick in my notes. He's later credited as the Dwarf. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the big... we this is actually what, good we're talking about because this is the first time we see him. We've been seeing all these indications that the Phantom's around, but then it just cuts to this guy peering down at the show going on. And I was like, mm -hmm. who's this? <laughs> and you are? Yeah, I'm and sorry. What like cuz I just expected, oh, well we're cutting to the rafters. It's going to be the phantom up there. No, it's just some guy, a weird-looking guy. Yeah. Actually, we had seen this guy earlier. We did see him in the lair in the establishing shot at the beginning of the movie, just yes. sitting there listening to the phantom play. But still, you're like and and so I'm going like, okay, so this is some kind of underling he has that cuz I'm not necessarily against the idea of there being some weird guy who's doing his bidding in places. In places, not doing all the murders, but is like setting some things up with him or something. That's fine if he has a crony. 
and that's true to to source material as give well. Me, give me a, give me an Otis to his Lex Luthor. Uh, what, gee, <laughs> Mister Phantom? Uh, I wrote him right here on my arm. Uh, see, uh, uh, and he reads off the coordinates. He was saying, "Oh, this movie could have used a Ned Beatty." Um, my arm wasn't long enough. You want to see a long arm, Otis? Yeah. Do you want to see a very long arm? Uh, uh, I love seeing yeah. that in the movie, but don't love Otis. No, terrible. You do love Ned Beatty, but it is maybe the single worst use of Ned Beatty. I love Valerie Perrine and Ned Beatty yeah. as, as actors, yeah. but yeah, I just, uh, that it's was just, a, it's I such a weird, love this. I've never sat down that, with Connor and gone, let's rethink this. I've never seen that movie as a kid and then later seen other Ned Beatty performances going like, oh, literally nothing else he ever did is like Otis. I don't know why this is a use. This guy's like a really he, solid. He did, he did other comedies, yeah. but yeah being like the the dolt he didn't do that very often no and he's a really solid actor like it's such a waste of his talent watch network and then and then watch superman the movie and so they're going holy god this is like a year between these two parts and look at this This (laughs) and he's literally doing like a dumb guy oh gee i don't know Uh, Uh, (laughs) are we going to addis ababa mr luthor that's that's the best Luther could get help wise. That's the best he oh, could do. That's um, a big thing for that character. Anyway, moving on. So once again, uh, the conductor has found. I don't know if he's found. He, he's found another book for the music, and he's conducting the show. And then when he turns a page, one of the pages is just torn out. And this is what I was thinking. Ooh, that phantom! What a scamp! I'm like, he's not yeah. killing anybody. He's kind of just fucking up the show a little bit. Well, he fucks it up pretty good in a second. Well, no, that's not even him that fucks it up. Damn it. No. I was about to go, oh, this thing that it's about to happen was a good moment. I liked yeah. it. Yeah. But we find out later. Legitimately late scary and, like, unsettling when this happens. Uh, because, yeah. Uh, Marie- Basically, Maria comes out to do so, and one she's of the singing. First- we cut to the Phantom. He's got a little, like, peephole that just his eyes looking through and he's watching the show. Yeah, it's a peephole through the chair in the. Yeah. In- Box. Yeah, um, and he's kind of cool. And he's sitting there going, "I love to peep." Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Sing for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's on stage alone singing the Joan of Arc song. Yeah. By the way, here's another failing of this film, and I'm sorry, guys. The, the opera itself. Well, just all the score. Yeah. Uh, here, here's an excuse when you're doing Phantom of the Opera. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are mm-hmm. to go balls out. Grand Guignot is the, is the, that's the core of the Phantom of the Opera. So you can go wildly big because it supports it. This is the material itself is operatic. The, the things right. the, uh, that so, the fucking title, like <laughs> when the, when the very first notes of the score start, I was like, Oh no, it's yeah. so, underplayed and then when we get to the opera within it the which the composer of the score uh, of the film score also wrote this fake opera it's not good this opera is embarrassingly bad i don't know why it matters who takes credit for it it's horrible it's horrible and it's just not the lyrics again. are bad the music's boring it's just Here's the thing that cracked me up again this is they're like well we don't want to pay rights uh, to any royalties any actual operas and besides our viewers are going to be english speaking so we'll do this fake opera for this thing and the lyrics will be in english so it's operatic singers singing these uh, english lyrics and the lyrics are so fucking stupid. There's a there's a scene with the townspeople in the opera where it's the English soldiers telling the French people that they're going that they're under martial law mm-hmm. um, and all this stuff. And there's <laughs> the one lyric that the the English soldiers like you Frenchies are so stupid and whatever it was and i was like that needs to be my new ringtone. Yeah. It'll be a non sequitur <laughs> and no one will get it. I just, but I'll crack yeah. up every I you just... Frenchies. That's right, Frenchie. <laughs> I'm talking about you. Uh, it's so it really is it's pretty amateurish. I feel like I could have knocked out these lyrics in a couple minutes. Uh, uh, yes, it's really the like only, the only thing I liked was and it's underplayed, but later on when we finally hear more of that song when Christine is singing it in a later mm-hmm. uh, point in the movie. 
uh, the it makes sense. The Joan of Arc story is she hears voices, the voice of God. So she's singing about, I hear your voice. I can't see you, but mm-hmm. it's in the thunder. And I was like, right. The Phantom is the bodiless voice that yeah. has that's coached fun. her and trained her. Yeah. I like that. It's just that this movie doesn't play that up. And plus the music, even bad. though I like that, that he's ri- he's written that before he was the phantom, but it's singing about the phantom, which is, you know, essentially. Yeah. yeah. But you know, Ooh, he's a- <laughs> the phantoms just through his people going like, well, wow, these lyrics really fit perfectly for our situation. You know what? I don't pretend to be psychic, but it's like, I nailed that shit. Yeah. I like, I nailed it. Honestly, look, oh. I have chills. Look, dwarf, I have chills. Look at this. I can't believe it. And the dwarf's I, like... I know the skin is gross, but uh, you, trust me, there's bumps there. Yeah. Get through the burned parts and you'll see the goosebumps. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the opera's bad. But while Maria's singing, yeah. suddenly the, there's a ripping sound. Yeah, and the, like this big sheet, curtain sheet that's beside her starts being torn open. And, yeah, the scrim. There's there's yeah. a part of the set. The scrim starts to being being torn from the top down by yeah. a hand. Yeah, and then the hand we see is attached to a body. The body is hung by the neck, and it swings out in, into the, the uh, stage. Yeah, in the lights, and the audience screams, and Maria screams. And this at this bit. point, I thought, well, maybe I have some hope for this movie. Me too. I was on there, board. There are a couple of good kills in this picture. I will say that. I was like, all right, we've got a. Uh, and who, it's just who a is this guy? Oh yeah, it's just it's just some guy who's been hung. It's not a particular. What what they imply, but I actually feel that something might have been cut. What I what they imply is it's perhaps because we did see the hunchback dwarf guy watching from the rafters, and this was a stagehand that gets hung. So it's very possible the stagehand was like, "Hey, you, what are you doing up here? You're not supposed to be here." Oh my god. Um, Get ready for that voice to come back when we talk about the cabbies in this movie. Oh god. Yeah, this movie couldn't escape the dreaded comic scene. What we don't have is a crowded tavern, though. That's a first for a Hammer movie. We don't, but we we get a fancy restaurant. We get a gaggle of cleaning women. Ooh, that... uh, no, no, they still make up for the goofy uh, ensemble. Uh, in oh, there somewhere. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. That uh, scene. That so hurt. everyone's screaming and panicking and leaving the theater. And I another good cut. It just hard cuts to the poster on the outside of the opera house and a guy putting postponed indefinitely over it. And I that, yeah. I chuckled at that. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Uh, so St. Joan the Opera has been postponed. They have to find a new lead because as we find out, Maria will never see her again. She just left. What she I do, like, I do like they said, they said she's never going to sing in this country again. I thought that was kind of funny. The idea that she's like, not only will I sing here, I won't sing in this entire country. What about Warwickshire? (laughs) No. What did Uh, I just say? I said the whole country. Scotland's nice. No. 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 All of the UK. Nowhere in the UK. That's right. Uh, (laughs) Does that mean you won't sing in India? I won't sing in India. Yeah. I'm a part of the kingdom at this point. The empire. Um, I also won't sing in yeah. China for other reasons. <laughs> they know what they did. <laughs> what? Uh, but I love immediately we have Darcy talking to Latimer in his office, and he's just like, yes, yes, I understand we have to let the police investigate, but I want no scandal to touch this show. Hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, don't know I understand. About... We have to investigate a murder, but I really don't want it to hurt the show at all. As if word of mouth, in fact, probably the news hasn't already talked about a yeah. hanging. It's <laughs> gonna. It, no matter what he does, this is gonna be the show where that guy got hung. You know, they're they're saying he committed suicide. I'm like, mm, okay, yeah. Uh, and so then it, uh, Latimer says, "Oh yeah, well Harry's holding auditions right now for a replacement." He's like, "What?" Without, Without my me? involvement, how mm-hmm. dare he? Um, yeah, Michael Goth. Is... You know he he's he's a at this point he's a very thin man. Yeah, and I can only assume that's why he was eating so much scenery. He was starving. This yeah. poor guy. So I'm hoping he, he got never gets his much fill. heavier. He goes from he goes from thin to gaunt in older age. Uh, Kind of true. Yeah. Yeah, he never really has a heavy period. He just becomes an no. old dude. Like, by the time you get to Alfred, he just has that gaunt old man neck. Um, oh, God bless him. Yeah. Um. 
So, yes, that is um, essentially the thing. He doesn't want any kind of uh, mar on his production, and he's highly offended that the producer of the show would be looking to hire a new singer without him. <laughs> How dare he? Uh, he goes down there. He goes down to the theater where the auditions are happening. Yeah. And, of course, you're not going to see anyone audition except for the person who's going to get the right. part. And it's Christine, and she has a... And she's young and lovely, so instantly Goff is like, Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, she'll do. She'll yeah, do yeah. just fine. It's almost like Latimer it, going. Weren't you going to yell? <laughs> Shush now. Yeah, it's great that Darcy is shown to not only just be just the world's biggest asshole. He a dog. Oh, he a straight up dog. This guy is eighteen hundreds Harvey Weinstein. He really is. I mean, it's the same stuff. He, he's like um. Oh, I think she'll do. I think she'll do quite nicely, but with a little training, of course. So could you send, give her my card? Oh, my God. That's um, my favorite part is he just peels off this card and he's like, Latimer, give this to her. And Harry's sitting right there going, dude, I know exactly what this shit is all about. I know what he's up to. This is what he always does. Latimer goes backstage to where all the girls in the show are so excited for Christine that she's doing so well. Oh, she was amazing out there. And he just Christine Charles, Christine Charles, Harry, (laughs) Harry Hunter and Christine Charles, their husband and wife detectives in your new favorite (laughs) Marvel comic. Um, (laughs) They're going to catch that werewolf by night. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Can we go an episode without bringing up Jack Russell? AKA no. Werewolf by Night. No. No, I don't think we can. <laughs> no, we are uh, contractually mentioned... obligated to mention that and or Tomb of Dracula. Yeah, uh, it's it, because we're doing the Monster right, Podcast. Right, yeah. And I have uh, fairly recently been on a reading the 1970s Marvel horror comics kick. So, yes, I will bring up myself Werewolf by Night and Monster <laughs> of Frankenstein, as like, they called it, and Tomb of Dracula. I like we're just assuming people are going to have a problem. Like, God, why do you guys keep talking about Werewolf by Night? I think this audience is probably cool with it. I know we got a lot of Mike Plug fans out there. A lot of Plug heads. Um, sadly, he only drew like the first 14 issues did, or whatever. He did, but he's they were indelible. They were, and he's got a fun name. Mike Plug. Plug. I'm a Plug fan. Um, um, <laughs> so yeah, all the girls are praising her. And Latimer just brings this card backstage, doesn't say anything, and hands it to her. She looks at it and says... Oh, uh, Mr. Darcy wants to have dinner with me. So he just has cards that say dinner tonight, question mark, or something? Or... Well, he actually, he actually writes a little note on the Does card. he write? It seemed like he just peeled the card off. Because I he like that He peels the card off, but he does, get, he does write something on it and then hands it off. All right, I may have but what I like is the way Latimer, when, when Latimer hands it to her, he, it's very good because there's a little kind of it's like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry that I have to do this, but here's his card. Yeah. Because she's innocent and she's just like, oh my God, I'm meeting with the the writer, the composer. This is amazing. And I just got the part. She can't see anything wrong about it. This guy, uh, Latimer, doesn't is, have anything nice to wear. He's the general manager, right? Yeah. Yet he seems to be presented most, most of the time as the lackey or assistant to Darcy. That's really yeah. bizarre. I know, They're that's always, what I was saying, that they, but not, the, the power structure of how this the theater is like running he, it seems, seems like really he's, out of whack. The thing with him is being the general manager, it seems like he specifically works for him, not the theater. That You always see them together. He's always doing his bidding. It's more than just him bossing people around with this guy. It seems like he is somehow indebted to him. Maybe so. Maybe the theater's latest bit. Or the <laughs> he last saved bit my life ago. 20 years ago, and I owe him a <laughs> life debt. Um, it's just when, yeah, that's right. He's a Wookie. Um, <laughs> um, quiet now, Lat- Latimer. Um, <laughs> I don't care what you smell. Yeah. Uh, uh, better movie if he was a Wookie. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, Latimer, if he didn't occasionally mention a theater man, a theater owner who was not going to like this thing or whatever, this mysterious theater owner that we never encounter. We do know that he answers to another boss, but I guess every time we see him in any scene, whatever Darcy says is what Latimer's going to do, which yeah. seems really strange because usually the theater owners are the ones with the power. <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. 
Uh, so anyway, all the girls backstage are like, oh, we're going to find you the great dress to wear and all that because they're all thrilled for her. They're not – I like. I actually do like that, that they're not jealous or something. They're just right? like, oh, Christine, like, you're so wonderful. We're so excited for you. That's nice. Yeah, the fairy tale has begun. Yay, yay, yay. Yeah. Um, so they're going to find her a and dress. And no word has gotten around about what a creep Darcy is. I, I can't imagine that. They should all know what a card – handed yeah. off by Latimer means. Well, we all have those cards. Uh -huh. John, do you need to talk about something off uh, mic? Uh... Yes. <laughs> no. uh... I'm ready I... to listen and believe. Um, <laughs> I know, so... Darcy. Um, he said he was so... going to help my career. Uh, so... Do we immediately cut to the dinner, the nice restaurant? No. she goes. She's now alone in the dressing room after the girl Oh, left. right. Yeah, she hears a mysterious voice. Who, who for half the movie just goes, young woman. Yeah. <laughs> young woman. I, I will learn your name eventually, but yeah. young woman. Excuse me. Excuse me, young lady. Yes. And he's like, young woman, you're very talented, yeah. a lovely voice, but it needs training. Yeah. I well, can train you. So here's the thing. Like, in the classic fandom story, he is specifically seeking out this woman, correct? In the classic Phantom story, he has seen her as like the embodiment of his music for years mm -hmm. and has been training her. She has long believed that it's this quasi supernatural being that her father, who's dead, has sent to her. Right. So she has accepted this as a supernatural force that's teaching her how to sing. So he has been sculpting her. Right. This is. You know, this novel came out around the same time as Trilby. So you had this right. story of Svengali and Trilby. So the story of this quasi-supernatural or just magnetic human being who is molding and shaping a young woman to become this perfect thing yes. was very much in the zeitgeist. So it's another one of those things. So, yeah, she's known without knowing that it's Eric or the Phantom. She just thinks the angel of music has been teaching her for years and even the universal movie has claude rains paying for singing lessons this whole thing about like they want to see her as a star this guy has this no, guy like could give a crap about her then hears her sing once and is like she's great i want to help but it's like yeah so his his plan before was just to fuck up the show end of plan All right so screw up darcy's uh making bank off of his own of his opera yeah so he wanted to sabotage it but now he's like Shit, the opera could be really good if this young woman, yeah, um, gets trained <laughs> by me. me. Young woman, no, 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 don't tell me your name. I don't care. <laughs> Let's keep this purely professional. <laughs> Granted, I'm speaking to you from your dressing room, and I can see you when you take your clothes off. But... Oh yeah, I maybe it did make me think. Where are his other peoples in this place? Yeah, uh, but but still, I you're just young them woman. everywhere. <clears throat> What cracked me up about the scene was, um, you know, again, I'm expecting this kind of thing. Like, yeah, okay, Phantom talking to Christine. But uh, her reaction is hilarious because she's like, she is concerned. And she's like kind of looking around. But then she's like, who are you? Where, well, where are and you? And one of the first things he says is, you will sing only for me. Mm -hmm. it's and like, she's like, huh. Yeah. She and doesn't run screaming out, like, going, someone's in there. Someone's in the dressing room. No, she's Someone just like, trying, I couldn't... who are you? Hello? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he's just like, and don't go to dinner with Darcy. He is a vile and vicious man. Yeah, and she's like, well, I'm going to take that under advisement, yeah. and I thank you. But I got to get ready for my fancy this dinner. This would have more impact if I could see you, probably. And uh, if you stop calling me young woman. Yeah. Excuse me, young woman. I said, don't tell me your name. Um, <laughs> it'll ruin the whole thing. Uh... That's not the way Daddy likes it. I'm sorry. That was creepy. <laughs> I know that was creepy. I'm very, I'm very sorry. This is a pretty asexual phantom. Uh, it is. Uh, I mean, which is a way to go. And but, we don't but necessarily also nonviolent, asexual. What am I watching this thing for? It, it it just boils down to him at the end of the movie being the loser, like a pathetic loser that w that you wanted to win. Yeah. But the edge of anything romantic or sexual is gone. The edge of anything violent yeah. or, you know, like um, 
he's brilliant, but he's unstable. That's not there. They they hint at the uh, the instability a couple times, but not really, and it doesn't go anywhere. No, he's he's basically just a wounded loser. Yeah. Is this fan a wounded loser? And Herbert Lom does what he can do. <laughs> I've always wanted to play a loser in a movie. Uh... <laughs> um, oh, that probably was Cary Grant's must... reaction. Cary Grant was like, "I'm sorry, this man's a loser." <laughs> I said I wanted to be in horror, not play a loser. Um. Get Chief Inspector Dreyfus for this. <laughs> Cluzo? Yeah. Oh, uh, Jesus. So, yeah, now Christine arrives at the restaurant, and uh, Darcy is creeping hard right from the beginning. He is basically like going... Don't eat too much, right? In fact, yeah. don't don't eat anything. Have some more wine. Yeah. Get this lady nice and drunk. It's basically well, his I, whole. I like when he thing. starts. Hey, I'll fill you up again. She's like, no, 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 no. I think I've had enough with the champagne. He's like, oh, good, a brandy instead. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's what you need. Uh, more alcohol. And at, at a certain point, she's talking about something, and he just says, "I wrote this down. You're a delicious little thing." Yep. <laughs> yep. And uh, yes, she could be so good with with his lessons i I can train you he says says like look we'll we'll have a little wine have a little food we'll chat Mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about what we know we're here to talk about Mm -hmm. and he goes and you get me right and then he's like going i'll train you you're going to be great for this and at first he's like oh really you would you'd you'd take the time out of your day to and he's like absolutely in fact we could start tonight she's like but it's late and the theater's closed he's like well my apartment's not closed my apartment is very very open yep Uh, so she's starting to get a little panicky yeah and he's he's getting nice and toasty he's kind of drunk um (laughs) yeah and so he's like i've got her in the bag and they're starting to head out wouldn't you know so nice Harry happens to be yeah. walking at the same time. Old Harry Hunter, at- P.I., shows up. Uh, Eating alone yeah. in a nice suit. Because yeah. when you're handsome and in your 30s and you're rich and you're in London and you're a theater producer, you probably go to dinner alone. Um, <laughs> well, who would, so he who would walk- ever want to be with this guy? For what reason? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> he comes in and she's like, oh, God, there is my my yeah. you know life preserver. That's my rescue and right there. Says- He's asked me to come back to his apartment for private training. He's like, hey, boy, yeah. It's, uh, Harry's almost like, we know like about the, that. I kind of like the scene because it is like, it's all about the implications. She doesn't say, help me. I don't want to do that. Yeah. She's like going, that's what he's offering. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's what I would like. Yeah. Oh, well, you have a nice night. And then Harry's like, don't worry, I got you. And he's like going, well, that sounds wonderful. You know what? I can open the theater. We could go over there now, all the three of us. We could like, get the- yeah, and then Darcy's like, ooh, you know, now that you mentioned it, it is it rather is late. late. Yeah. So, uh, he has been cock-blocked, to yeah. use a, an un- unkind term. <laughs> But um, he cocked block me, Latimer. Um, and and Harry does say that he's like Darcy's going to be really pissed about that, and he's going to get his revenge. But she's like, "Thank you so much." So yeah. essentially, Harry. And then he says, "You probably didn't need anything when you were with him. Why don't you have dinner with me? I'll take you home." Uh-huh. And, mm-hmm. Uh huh. And and they do, and then it cuts to them in a in a handsome cab, and uh, he's telling her, "You know, well, we've been having all these problems with the opera." I don't really know what the deal with this show is, but weird, mysterious things keep happening. And I'm said, going to <laughs> give you a little exposition while we're in the cab. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he says, it almost seems like there's something, I don't know, evil trying to stop the show. Love that line. Love that line. There's something evil in that theater that really wants to stop this show. But he says in a way where he's like, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Could be, I just feel something unholy. Yeah. You know, whatever. But the thing that that bugs me, uh, uh, many things bug me. But again, yeah. the idea that the Phantom has really just been active for like the last month or so. <laughs> that this is all so new and is really just focused on this one show. And I'm like, dude, I want the Phantom of the Opera to have been under this theater for years and have been fucking with them constantly. It's like, what is this nonsense yeah. of like? I don't know what's going on. Well, he was Seems really, weird. He was evil. really chill until he heard them put it on his show. Then he's like, what, what? <laughs> I don't care for this. 
but I don't know what I'm going to do about it. How about you, Dwarf? you have any ideas? I've only been the Phantom for about 25 minutes, it seems like, so if you've got any ideas... I'm not good at this whole being a monster thing. Uh, <laughs> and I won't get any better by a movie's end. You know what? Maybe I'll steal some music off the guy's uh, music stand. Oh, that'll get him just one that'll page. Go. I'll tear out of it, too. Woo-hoo! I might chop up a timpani drum. Oh, Good oh, luck oh. putting your... Sh- <laughs> You just turn through the vents. Good luck putting your show on now! Uh, without that drum! You know we just need a new skin put on that drum. It'd take like 15 minutes. Oh. It's not a big deal. Oh. Hello, is that you? Hello, Phantom? I, I mean, uh, nice try, but we got it. Don't I'll, worry. Uh, I'll go back to my lair and regroup. Think this <laughs> over. Come up with a new plan. Damn it. Uh. But don't worry, it'll be plenty evil. Yeah. Oh, it'll be so evil. Oh, were you going to kill someone? No, no, I would never. Uh. I might glue your shoes to the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck moving with shoes glued to the floor. <laughs> It, it was. I was like waiting for him to replace a bucket of fake snow with water or something like that. He's just yeah. pulling pranks, tying their shoelaces together. <laughs> what? Oh, and he's just giggling. Yeah, I heard the most eerie giggling coming from nowhere. <laughs> I just. I want to hear Herbert Lom giggle. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so Someone yeah. Someone drew a penis on my forehead with a marker while I was uh, taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> the Phantom strikes again! <laughs> Ooh, and yeah, then it's just Michael Goth going, Phantom! <laughs> Phantom! Curse you! <laughs> uh, so, and then uh, upon his thing about there's something evil trying to stop the show or whatever. Uh, this is when Christine says, oh, you know, now that you mention it, I heard an eerie, mysterious voice earlier. He's like, oh, really? (laughs) And so he says, he says, uh, hey, oh my God, this fucking cabbie. Hey, cabbie, uh, why don't you turn it around and we're going to go to the opera house instead. Hey, but you be closed by now. Why do you want to go to the (laughs) This guy is the first time in the Hammer films uh, because we hear other lines of dialogue from the cab driver. Mm-hmm. This is the first time in any of these films where I was like going, I understood very little of that. It does. And I'm good with these accents, yeah. but it was so thick. And so, and so like, I'm a kind of goblin together. I was like, I have no idea what that man just said. Yeah, and Harry's just like, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Put the closed cab thing on and goes, Okay, Governor. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. You just let. It is. What? <laughs> I love the idea of actual British audiences watching. Is going. Do you have any idea what that man just said, darling? I... It makes me think of one of my favorite SNL sketches. Don't go around a reroute row. Have you seen that one? It's the <laughs> no. trailer for the British gangster movie, but they can't. Everything is just and he shot the dumb typhoon from a day. And the title is even Don't Go Row Re Row Row. Uh you gotta look it up. It's so it's one of my favorites. And there's a what point era, what era is that from? It's uh Bill Hader, Fred Armisen. Uh Don't Go Row Re Row Row. Don't go round a re row row. Uh I'm and there is a point it in it when, and it's it, Bill Hader's so good at just doing the yeah, I've been so alive and he's threatening and they're <laughs> acting out like a Guy Ritchie movie. Uh and uh yeah, and eventually there's a point in it when he's talking to, I think, Nassim Pedra, and, he, and he's yelling, and she just goes, what? <laughs> uh, uh, it's a, it's it a great sketch. Um, anyway, so yeah. Uh, so anyway, this <laughs> indecipherable cab driver uh, then takes them back to, and then, boy, if you thought the Cockney accents were done, get ready, folks. Oh, uh, man. Because they get to the opera house just in time for the cleaning ladies to be doing their business. Okay. <clears throat> so the cleaning ladies. And what makes no sense is why the theater uh, producer, mm-hmm. the show producer, would not be recognized by them. But also um, that he would humor them yeah. for like 18 minutes <laughs> is what it feels like. This is what, like a because third of the movie? Uh... They are scroungy ladies 
who have bags of trash that they've collected from the theater mm -hmm. and we watch them for conservatively half an hour sit there going oh i found some lovely things that they keep dropping all the wonderful i didn't find I, anything but the i have to say though i was delighted to see this early performance from the cast of monty python uh i really it really it is a money it's a hundred percent this is a monty python in drag it's sketch they're pepper pots yeah. they're pepper pots oh, ladies, yeah, yeah. I I found a lovely treasure over here. It's all just. Like it actually actually was uh, thinking of of uh, of Terry Jones from from a uh, uh, Holy Grail going. Yeah. There's some lovely filth down here. Absolutely, it's totally that. Oh, I found some lovely filth uh, down here. That's all I could think about watching this whole scene was just like that they one's are... our battle. That one's yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're looking at, at the trash they've collected from the theater and the producer guy harry is like excuse me ladies uh have you guys and they're like and who are you what do you think you're doing right here and he's like well i'm the See, producer oh, and I'm, the queen of england. Yeah. oh and I'm the queen of england Number one, this guy shows up in a tuxedo like uh -huh. getting out of a handsome cab with this woman who's dressed to the nines as well. And also but wouldn't she's they also been in the chorus. So she's yeah. been in that theater for, you know, a while. Yeah. He would know her and doesn't matter. the producer would be in charge of everything. Um, but he humors him. He's like, well, okay, ladies. Um, and then he goes, by the way, you wouldn't have happened to found like a, um, a golden brooch or something. Cause I dropped on that. Oh, where were you sitting? And he goes, Oh, and blah, blah, blah. So he sent them on a wild goose chase. Yeah. They're like, oh, it might still be in the theater. Oh, that's my section. Oh. So they run into the theater looking for an imaginary and piece we, of and jewelry. We, and we as not are supposed to be like, this guy right here. Yeah. And we're also supposed to be amused by these women. And I am not. Well, I am, but for the wrong reason. Yeah. It is, as you say, me just having Monty Python flashbacks. Yeah. And it's also me it's, just going, why? Why? Is because these hammer the films, they always like... We need some leavening comedy. Here's yeah. a cute little, and no, it's not funny. Uh, but they between right. all the bouts of terror, the people are probably <laughs> going to need a little bit of laughs. Harry and Christine are now, I don't know, I, it's not like they were really being obstructed anyway, but now they're free to wander around and look. But then they hear a terrifying scream from the women in the theater, and they start coming out. Oh, we saw him. We saw the ghost. Oh, get out of here while you can. Yeah. So they run away from the ghost, and we're like, ooh. Then we see a creepy shadow. Oh, that doesn't come yet. First, Harry does talk oh. to the voice. Oh, he goes. Right. He goes okay. backstage to the dressing room, and he's like, "Was the voice over here? Somewhere over here? Hello, voice. Uh, why don't you talk to me?" And it, the voice is basically like, this doesn't concern you. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, you better get away because he says there are forces of evil at play in this theater. It's pretty amazing that um, that the theater ghost, um, I guess, never leaves the phone. Uh, I guess he's just always near whatever yeah. little uh, oh. hole he's going to be talking into. He's like, oh, someone's there. <laughs> oh, it's that hairy guy. Listen to me, young man. And young woman. Yeah. Don't tell Get me out. either one of your names. I specifically said no <laughs> names. This is an anonymous thing. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I'm hideous. Uh, <laughs> but yes, that's right. He does kind of, it's another one of those warnings where it's, we're getting the impression already that the Phantom really isn't a threat or evil because no, he's, he's like, his advice to everyone's just like, please leave. You should leave for your best interest. Evil forces at work. Not yeah. me. Not me, understand, because I'm totally cool. I'm fine. There are evil forces here. There's a dwarf I can't control. Who Apparently knows what he he's can. up to? I don't know a <laughs> single thing about him, but I've been living with him. I know the whole idea of, like, I don't know anything about him, and he's uncontrollable. Well, you know he killed a guy. I mean, you pretty famously know that a dude was hung and swung yeah. right out into so people think you did that maybe then, you'd want to clear your name or stop this homicidal dwarf i do like the idea that when that happened he's like oh i really should go up and tell them that i didn't do well wait a minute they are closing the show so i guess you know maybe. what they kind of kind of worked yeah all I mean, right dwarf we're gonna let it slide but just this once i, I meant no harm to that stagehand whose name was larry and i always liked him yeah. but um uh, 
He was a nice fellow, well, but unfortunately, means to an end, you know. He uh, goes, you know what? I'm going to make a lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Take these lemons. Make some lemonade. This is It's such a just <laughs> ineffectual nothing phantom. <laughs> That's the, a big problem. It's a big problem, softening the character this much and taking away just the sort of the burning core of him until he's just a wounded loser which is the whole thing i'm ugly they stole my music he's just a whiny little guy it's a whiny little guy who oh, doesn't really nobody wants to talk to little old me and and he ends up being a hero at the end i guess <laughs> anyway so then we have the scene after where they th- they see the shadow and you're like oh no it's the phantom no, instead, and it's it's a rat catcher. It's who we're gonna spend eighteen minutes rat with. Catcher. Yeah. Not the one nope. from DC Comics. No, nope. uh, and he <laughs> that is sad. It wouldn't make any sense, but still, um, this rat catcher again. The writer is like, they're gonna love this eccentric character. They're gonna oh, love him. He talks I'm gonna about give catching rats for two pages of dialogue. Yeah. yeah. See, I catch the rats. I do put them in this bag. You know about rats, don't you? Do you want to see a rat? You're just like, oh my god. He's like, oh, you got some nice fat ones tonight. You want to see them? Yeah. And he sticks his hand in the bag. And goes, oh no, none of that now, because I guess they're biting him. He's like, no, no. And he's like, uh, oh, well. I like, he says, oh. I'll sell you one. They make a nice pie. I know. Right there. And you're like, and this guy, this actor's going for it because he's like, well, well, my time to shine. He actually is going for it. And yeah. he looks familiar. I'm not going to look him up. Well. You you keep talking. I'm going to look him up. I'm uh, convinced I've seen him in something else. You definitely have. Oh, my God. It was Patrick Trotton. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, my right. God. It was. It was fucking Doctor Who. Yep. Doctor Who was the rat catcher. Yep. And I, the makeup, which was not great, was at least enough for me to not immediately recognize him. Yep. As one of the delightful doctors. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a few years out from being the doctor, but pretty close. Pretty close. Uh, and, you know, he he's one of the best. He was the one who played the recorder. Yeah. I, I love Troughton. And we shall see him again in one of these. Wow. He will appear I can't in one believe of our Dracula. I think I've known him before. Yeah. He looks familiar. I had to look well, it up, but yeah. Uh, I didn't I didn't recognize him either, but as soon as I saw oh him, my I God. Like, oh, my that God, was... it's Patrick Troughton. I have an action Doctor figure of this who? man in my apartment. Um, as the rat catcher. <laughs> yes, as the rat. I love me some rat catcher. Uh, oh, I got like, some nice fat ones tonight. Yeah. Look at this one. Yeah, I'm the rat catcher. <laughs> All right. So the thing is, he. Anyway, hey, test audiences on your comment cards. Be sure to mention the rat catcher. <laughs> <laughs> on your comment cards. I like him looking out to the camera. Remember the name, rat catcher. <laughs> say you want a spin off. Assayed by Patrick Trout. Yeah. Um, recommend me to the folks at the bbc he goes back in the theater and he screams or he doesn't scream he gets yeah. killed he gets fucking stabbed in the eye and this was once again where all of a sudden i'm sitting up a little taller going now wait a minute this movie's getting good but we gets... see it's not the phantom who does it we see this we do yeah. see that this is the the hunchback puts dude, a knife right it. in his eye and then his hammer so we get that gloriously red bloody eye and he's like ah once again Trout yeah. makes a meal out of this death too he, ah! he hits a dagger in the eye socket ah! and he staggers and he falls and his rats escape from the bag which yeah. is the telltale to Harry when he see or actually Christine sees him and is like oh no and, wh- and Harry's like wait a minute <laughs> Harry picks her up so the rats aren't anywhere near her and puts her up right. on like a stack of boxes so she's mm-hmm. away from all the rats and he's like I, the hero of the movie, will go check this out. Uh, and so he runs into the theater. and then, Very heroically. Yeah, but he leaves her behind, which is just when the Phantom... Very heroically. <laughs> <laughs> you stay here. Um, and then he's just slowly turned to Dudley Do-Right, in my impression. Um, <laughs> oh, no. Um, he, uh, yeah, so he runs back in there, and then the Phantom appears where Christine is, and he's like... Come with me, Christine. She's like, yeah. no. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is pretty ineffectual. He's like, well, okay. Oh, that was oh. my big play. Damn it. <laughs> but uh, is this is this like one of the first times we see full body yes, him? It is. Because he's standing at the top of a set of stairs and he's holding his hand up going, take my hat. Very dramatically. He is dressed in black with a cloak and he's got the mask on and his hair is all kind of shocked out. Listen, and I, it's not a bad look. I, li- I like the look of this phantom. And I like I like the messed up hands and stuff like that. I like. It's interesting to me, though, again, Herbert Lom, yeah. just because of his build, is actually very similar to Claude Rains. Yeah. And the fact that you yeah. have a middle-aged man, short yeah. middle-aged man, and not, not paunchy, but not like you know, slender. I so you do have... my sit up, sir. <laughs> I'll have you know I walk three miles a day. Um, but he's imposing enough, and yeah. it's dramatic. And he's like, "Come with me." But it is funny that Christine, who's played by oh god, uh, I, didn't even, I didn't even bother to look. Heather Sears. Heather Sears. Heather yeah. Sears. Um, who I did look up actually earlier, and had a decent career she was but in some she, stuff you know she died young which yeah. i that was sad um at 58 yeah. it's a shame but um so anyway she's pleasant and cute and that's about all she needed to be for this i guess but it is funny the way she kind of just goes no uh uh-uh. uh creepy town oh she screams actually and i do like the way lom plays it's almost like of all the reactions i never expected that uh that that really threw me all right right. there's no reason to be rude do you have any idea the courage it took to come out here and say how i feel damn it you know what uh give me a second i really have to regroup yeah uh i thought for uh, sure come with me christine would be enough damn it (laughs) stupid phantom uh I stood in front of a mirror and practiced this whole pose with the hand out and the... Oh, dwarf, you know how long I've had a crush on Christine. It did not go well tonight, my friend. It did not go well. Uh... I am so going to journal about this. <laughs> Dear diary. Um... <laughs> well, looks like Christine won't be mine. He's laying on his stomach on his bed with his legs up in the air going like, Oh, diary, will Christine ever realize how I feel about her? And you write some parentheses, womp, womp, and then <laughs> sad trombone. Uh, womp, womp. Yeah. <laughs> womp, womp. Uh, yeah, poor, poor, he gets, uh, he gets dissed. Yeah. And then, uh, I, I did write, uh, Harry comes running when he hears the scream and the phantom just deuces, man. He's out of there. He's yeah. like, oh, oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ixnay on the airy hay. Yeah. Oh, wait, another fella? I don't think so. Because once again, I am a completely nonviolent man, so he would beat the shit out of me in a fight. Uh, that actually is the feel you get. He's like going, I am really not in this weight class. Yeah. I need to get out. This is not a I phantom want- who's going to sword fight with anyone. This is not a phantom who's going to do anything even remotely cool. And we miss out on the things we should have. Yeah. A yeah. badass phantom. Yeah. Well, we're going to get him someday when King Leonidas plays him. No, we're not. <laughs> I mean, say what you will about Gerard Butler. He is a noted screen badass. Yes. Terrible phantom. I know. Hot take. Terrible, Hot take. terrible yeah. phantom. I thought he was beloved by all in that part. Um <laughs> we'll get there. That's much later in the show, but we will get to that Phantom movie. Uh, bum, 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 bum. It does have that, though. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, the music I'm always down for, and I think that's probably the, the greatest Christine we'll ever get. Oh, Emmy Lovely. Ross, Wonderful. I mean, luminous, lovely, young, and actually could do that singing. She was hitting those damn notes. Like, she can actually sing. She's like opera train from childhood or whatever. I mean, she's so like the real deal. the best Christine we'll ever have. And well, not a good... you want to tell that to Sarah, Sarah Brightman? <laughs> oh well, I mean, I'm talking cinematic on screen, on screen, absolutely. And actually, Sarah Brighton, I don't think is a very good actress, but I didn't oh. see the show. Yes. I have the soundtrack. Yes, vocally, vocally, yeah, bring it. I love that '80s music video they made for the Phantom of the Opera. Oh song. dear God, yeah, <laughs> where it's all just wow. like mellowy white curtains behind them and smoke machines. Which is kind of what the Broadway show looked like. I yeah. mean, the Broadway show was an MTV musical on stage. Um, it's what I love about it, man. I know. 
Uh, thanks for listening to Phantom Cast. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, I John and I's weekly dissemination of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom. I'll tell you this: when we get to Robert England's Phantom, that guy's definitely killing people. Um, <laughs> I can't stop killing. <laughs> That's people. all they hire Robert England to do in movies. Uh, and crack wise, yeah. Ooh, he's a quippy phantom, that one. Um, he can't get enough. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he uh, he runs away. Uh, she says, I saw him. I saw the ghost or whatever she says. And once again, Harry goes, I believe you. I believe you. Yeah. I believe everyone. Um, and she, she at least uh, is not as um, weirdly fantastical as Maria. She goes, he was wearing a mask. Yeah. And he only, uh, you can only see one eye. Yeah. So she's not like going, he had one eye in the middle of his head. Yeah, actually, now that I've seen him, he's less scary. He's just sort of a guy in a weird mask. He's just a guy. <laughs> he's a I don't cape. Think, I don't think he'd even hurt anybody. Yeah. In fact, as soon as he heard you, even one footstep of yours, he seemed to run away like a coward. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'd do some digging. I bet he has like a friend or somebody who does all the... <laughs> You know, yeah. all the actual murder. This guy, he doesn't seem very murdery to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting a murdery vibe. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Then, oh, yeah. So, uh, Harry comes in, and Darcy's holding more auditions. And there's this woman singing. He's like, oh, my God, stop. For the love yeah. of God, woman, you're terrible. She's not that bad, but he's just like, get the hell off that stage. I'm a monster. So what we understand is that because uh, Christine bailed on that that uh, little tryst, um, he is going to recast the part. Yeah. He's fired Christine. Well, that's what he, he didn't that's get. That's what he tells Harry when he comes in. He's like, I understand. Why are you auditioning? We already agreed Christine is. He's like, no. Not only have I not given her the part, but I've fired her from her chorus part as well. Yeah, again, the power that this guy, as the composer of the piece, has is weird. And then uh, because when, he also goes on to fire Harry. Yeah, Harry's like, "Oh, we agreed to this. You can't do this. What? Just because she wouldn't sleep with you?" He's like, "That's it. You're done too." Yeah. The he fires the producer of the show. I don't think the composer of a play can fire the producer. I don't believe so. <laughs> don't think that's how things work. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, Anthony Hines. I know you've been dead for a while. Listen, uh, uh, what was your thinking on how things work in the theater? Because you seem to not know. <laughs> for a man who was a producer. Uh, I know. <laughs> shit, Anthony <laughs> Hines lived till 2013. Well, he was a young man when this was going on. Yeah, um, he was 91 when he died in 2013. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. And he was he was <laughs> the who could forget his writing of Godzilla versus Wolfman. What? He wrote the screenplay for Godzilla versus Wolfman. He, I don't even know what that could be. He's one of the writers. I can't even picture what that could be. I, I don't either. I've never heard of this. All right, you do the research, you get back to us. All right. Well, there's a picture of Nicolas Cage having purchased the original poster for this movie. Oh, nice. <laughs> Which adds up. Yeah, it makes so perfect it's, sense. It's not, it's not the Wolfman. It's just a giant Wolfman. Yeah, I, I figured it was a giant Wolfman, but then I just don't understand the concept of a giant Wolfman. Yeah. Uh, Godzilla was, it consists of a werewolf appearing in Japan, which becomes irradiated and grows to enormous size. Oh, a giant wolf man encounters Godzilla in the countryside, and uh, you'll never believe it, these two monsters battle. <laughs> How could this not have happened? I don't understand <laughs> where where the money train ended on this, because this should be a movie we're still talking about yeah, today. Yeah, I know. Well, apparently Nicolas Cage is still talking about because he looks pretty proud to be taking home that poster. Uh... <laughs> This cost me more than Action Comics number one. Oh, man, you'll never believe the genius of Godzilla versus Wolfman. It's a subtle, <laughs> interesting note. Uh, <laughs> the most underrated of Godzilla pictures. Uh, They're both kind of aliens and loners and misfits, yeah. like me and Superman. 
I see Godzilla as a lone samurai wandering the countryside. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Noted weirdo, Nicolas Cage. Um, man, if Hammer existed like it did then, Cage would be a golden star of these films. Hammer, Hell yeah. These Hammer movies would be built for a Nicolas Cage. Um, he would have been a great like takeover if Christopher Lee wasn't going to show up to do Dracula, like Brides of Dracula, yeah. if it had been Nicolas Cage instead of that blonde guy. Yeah. You'll never I... stop me, Van Helsing. Uh... <laughs> well, let's not forget that the next vampire film that Hammer makes, and perhaps the next film we'll be doing, is Kiss of the Vampire. Yes, that which is are a... 100% correct. And uh, let's not forget that, of course, Nicolas Cage was in Vampire's Kiss. Uh, a, uh, a a movie that we probably will cover at some point, maybe on the show, because it is fucking crazy, that movie. Crazy. It was one of the first VCR, v, VHS purchases I made. <laughs> that movie, was, that mo- I don't know that I would say that movie's good, but it is riveting. It was in a used rental bin, and I was like, you know what? I want to own it. Yeah. I, and I did. For a long I own time. a copy of it, but I am a Nicolas Cage super fan. So I am. A there huge, you go. I'm a huge Cage fan. So. Uh, All right. Yeah. So we'll uh, hold on to that. That's gold. Yeah. We'll definitely talk about it. Um, but uh, so anyway, uh, you, <laughs> where the hell were we? Uh, oh, yeah. So so Harry gets fired. And then this like va va voom redhead comes out on stage. And Michael Goth is like hello and we can tell that she's an okay singer and not much better than anybody else but she's really working it yeah which is working for goff he's like she gets it she knows what she needs to do to get this part La- latimer is latimer's seduced. like she's not that good a singer hey but check out the sweet rack says michael goff mm-hmm. uh. again weird dialogue you're not expecting from that period but he says check out that sweet rack yeah I would pay anything to hear Michael Goth saying, check out that sweet rack. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Those are some major league yabos, my friend. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh... You could balance a tea set on those. Oh, my God. Well, and so mm. we see later that this woman does get the lead role so presumably she does it with goth this night yeah she gets the lead role for about five minutes yeah because she's terrible yeah <laughs> uh so uh harry goes to christine's where she has the letter they just they sent he sent latimer with a letter telling her she's fired uh and latimer even says to harry and his he's like god knows i didn't want to do it he made me send it to her I never wanted anyone to get hurt. I just wanted to manage a theater. I don't even understand how he outranks me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm as confused as you are. And he looks at the camera. Yeah. And you. <laughs> I don't know what my job is. Uh, so he goes there <laughs> and he says, hey, don't be upset. All right. This is a good thing. All right. We're free of that thing now. And I'm taking you out to lunch. Uh, yeah, you he's got, like, look, here's the thing. We're both fired, so let's party. Yeah. And so she goes to get changed. And as you do, he just starts poking around her apartment mm-hmm. for a little too long, if you ask me. This scene goes. Yeah. <laughs> it he's takes like, a while for him to find the clue that's important to the plot. He's like, oh, a music box. This is nice. Oh, look, some French postcards. These are saucy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's. It's not French postcards. He looks at the little uh, flip animated yeah. movie thing. Yeah. And so we get the uh, and we see, early. We, we see that in its entirety. Yep. Yeah. Uh, again. And he's like, ho, ho, ho. So delightful. 12 minutes later. Uh, then he's looking at a uh, a changing screen. Yeah. Um, that is, has a painted uh, like um, mural on it. Mm-hmm. And at the base of the mural... Because he, I don't know, he's just fascinated with this thing. He's looking at the base of the mural, which has a painted piece of music yeah. as part of the but, design, and he's looking at the music, going, "Huh." Here's something that I can't like. If I saw this sort of uh, uh, changing screen room divider thing or whatever, 
I think most people would just be like, oh, that's nice, and then pass over it. This guy is on his knees looking at this, finds the piece of music, and then is reading the individual notes on the piece of music? Yes. And then... <laughs> and um, da, 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 da. Wait, I know this. Uh, yeah, he's like, come on, this is weird. And at that point, the um the matron of the house whatever she walks yeah. in and she's like as if she's caught him doing something naughty yeah because he goes to be like oh i uh i was just yeah, couldn't she wasn't have changing it. behind that screen it's i like, know there was no it's like he's just looking at this art but it, she's like <clears throat> and he's like oh pardon i just and then the he says, existence this, of a changing uh, screen is somehow naughty <laughs> he, he's like uh where'd you get this thing and she goes oh well i painted that and he goes did you where did you get the piece of music here? Because this music's very familiar. And she goes, oh, well, I based that. This is all where it's like, I'm laying out everything for you right now. Also, Here's where the... Can we tell you about what a fucking coincidence it is that Christine Crazy. happens to live in the place that the Phantom used to live? Yes. That has a representative of his work. And then even more examples of his work. She goes, well, I, I don't know music. I just based that on a piece that was left behind by one of my former tenants, this guy named Professor Petrie, um, who taught P taught singing mm -hmm. and composed music. And I'm like, wow, taught singing and composed music. This is all coming together very well. Yeah. And he's like, well, do you have any other pieces of his music? And she's like, well, he left some behind. Take a look. He's looking and he's like, oh, God, this is all familiar because this is all the music that uh, Darcy uh, claimed was his. Yeah. And then she goes, and he goes, what happened to Petrie? And she goes, oh, well, he died. In a fire, she says, at the printers. And he's like, Died in a fire at the printers. And so then it uh, cuts to, instead of taking her on the lunch date, he takes her to the printers. Uh, uh, Harry takes Christine to the printers, and he's like, no, 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 we're doing detective work now. Yeah, uh, their date becomes detective work. Uh, but again, I love the kind of detective work where everything gets wrapped up in an afternoon because this is essentially what happens. Yeah, because he goes in there and says, uh, oh, yeah, I want to ask about that fire that happened. And the guy running the print shop is like, oh, yes, terrible thing, terrible thing. He goes, yes, I know someone died. It's like, oh, no, no one died. No one died. Someone was horribly burned. Horribly but they, burned. They terribly burned. And he says, <laughs> well, what happened? And he's like, well... Obviously, he broke in through that window, started a fire, and then tried to put the fire out with this. And look at this. It's acid. Probably splashed yeah. in his face. Yeah, here's the thing you don't want to do. Throw acid on a fire. Yeah. Much less have it splash back on your face. Yeah, so anyway, terrible thing. And he's like, well, who was this guy? He's like, I don't know. Burglar or something. And so yeah, he seemed to be <laughs> trying to uh, steal some music or destroy something that was being printed or whatever. Then it it's just like to, he's he's on the street and he's just talking to this policeman who's like, "Oh yes, I remember that fire. That yeah. was I, I I was I was on duty that night. In fact, I was the first officer to respond." You're like, <laughs> and Harry just goes, "Man, this is really working out for me." <laughs> yeah. Bingo bongo. It's just it's all I'm asking for is one scene where he asks a cop who's like, "Oh, you want to talk to Sergeant Callahan at the whatever?" That would have been fine. Nope, we've no. got no time for that. The first person he asks is a person who knows all about it. The next person he asks is the next person who has the next bit of yeah. information. And then after he finishes talking to the cop, he turns the corner, and there's Petrie in the mask. He goes, you wouldn't happen to know anything about the, the guy who uh, almost died in that fire. Well, yes, that was well, me. Well, here's, here is the convenience thing. He goes, uh, yes, uh, well, he came running out of there, holding his hands to his face, and he jumped right there in that river there. So not only has yeah. he found this cop, but he's found this cop who just happens to be on duty at the exact place that this guy jumped into the river. Yeah, and he goes, well, did you recover the body? And he goes, well, no, the river was really fast, and that yeah. guy was just really burned, so oh, there's yeah. no way. Yeah. There was no way we were going to find him. No. He's probably and so dead. Harry almost instantly is like going, well, geez, look where – like the river you could actually yeah there's a little grate and if you yeah. do this thing if you go under it he i mean it takes Jesus. nothing to just like he puts his head over the thing and just turns to the right he's like right there that's obviously where he went <laughs> and the cop goes you have shamed me so i'm turning <laughs> in my badge well anyway here's my badge and uh i'm done i hear there's work for rat catchers yeah. well i'll see you later <laughs>
<laughs> I hear the opera house just lost their rat catch in some kind of accident. Uh, so yeah, they see where it goes instantly. And then he's like, oh, well, anyway, let's get lunch. And she's like, no, now it's like three in the afternoon. We can't have lunch. And like, oh, right. Yes, we spent all day detectiving. Uh <laughs> He's wrapped. I am by the way, tuckered out from detective. He's wrapped this up in what, like three hours? He's wrapped up this yeah. mystery. <laughs> yeah, this guy. Yeah, again, uh, the the phantom has been a phantom for about two weeks, and the mystery of the phantom has been solved in an afternoon. <laughs> I may have problems with the way this story was controlled. <laughs> yeah, we're just like done and done, sir. Hey, done got, and done. We've got eighty five minutes. We got no time. Um, and yet they waste time like crazy in this movie. Uh. So then it cuts to it's night now and Harry and Christine are snuggling up in the back of this cab. Yeah, again, the love story here has taken an afternoon. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh they're they're madly in love with each other. They're madly in love and um they want to go one more time around the park, but they've already been around the park a million years and the handsome cab driver oh, I was you I would take you round the park but my it's wife important. gets awful scared at night it's getting late and she does a um so yeah at that point they're like oh all right fair we, point we sir right he's frothing yeah yeah let's rise um, oh, and so they keep doing this bit though, where they keep they kiss, and he keeps poking his head in or whatever. He's like, oh, "Everything all right?" Oh Jesus Christ! And I'm just like, "Oh God, here's more bits." Because <laughs> he pokes his head in the side. He's like, "All right, then I'll go up in the front and drive." And then he like pulls open the roof, and he's like, "Everything's still all right?" And they're about to kiss again. He's like, "Oh boy, that cabbie, am I right?" <laughs> Oh, you're, that cabbie. You're killing us over here. <laughs> just, but I know the audience is eating it up. <laughs> Once again, you just imagine guys, somebody, somebody's holding I, their I, gut I, laughing. I, <laughs> oh, he can't guys, believe I, that I, cabbie. I, I was of that audience because I watched this film. We weren't dying laughing. <laughs> no, I'm speaking on behalf of the audience. Yeah. Please, less of this cab driver. And more of the good stuff, okay? And more Please. rat catcher. Uh, <laughs> we demand more Doctor Who <laughs> rat catcher. Yeah, once I found it was Patrick Trout, and I'm like, oh, make the whole movie about him then. Uh, make the whole movie about him. Give him more to do. I am excited to see if he has a bigger, more important part in that Dracula movie coming up. But uh, We're, we're going to find out. Yeah, we'll see when we get to Scars of Dracula. Uh, so, uh, anyway, on the ride back... Uh, Harry's just like, oh yeah, uh, because he says something about like, uh, well, I put together who the uh, who the Phantom is, and she's like, yeah. do you have who is this? Like, well, it's pretty clear that uh, Darcy stole all the music for uh this opera from this guy, uh, Professor Petri or Petri there. He's uh, he's obviously got to be the Phantom. She's like, oh, well, that's good to know. Yep, <laughs> solved. <laughs> oh Jesus, um. And so they drop her off at her house and then she comes in uh, and and she goes over to the window and opens the drapes and what's this? It's dwarf sidekick. He's there. Oh no. And she screams and then it just cuts to her. He's got the dwarf sidekick is carrying her into the lair unconscious. Mm-hmm. This cracks me up because um, you know, carrying scenes are, are tricky. Mm-hmm. And when you're, I thought, the Phantom set up in a pretty nice lair for himself, but he couldn't make a little footbridge <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. the dwarf is carrying her and has to physically go down into the little river, the mm-hmm. little runoff, to cross that and then lift her back up on the other side. Clearly not the, the actual actor. This is a stuntman, right. and it's evident. And it is, unfortunately it, for the actress, the one day they brought in Lon Chaney Jr. just to do this scene <laughs> where he had to carry her. Oh, what, what, what am I, a dwarf? I never played one of those before. All right, I'm a dwarf now. Yeah, you sure you don't want me to put on the wolfman makeup? You want um, Where's my harness? The one I had as a mummy? You got the mummy harness? You, no? you, you got to strap the lady to me. All right, well, if you don't have the harness, yeah, have some jack. <laughs> I need a, a, a uh, crate well, of jack. I'm like uh, Papa. I've been instead of spinach, just Jack Daniels. Did you say a bottle? No, I need a crate. Yeah. 
<laughs> and a full crate of Jack. Um, and so amazing, he Eldrick, drinks a full crate in five minutes. Uh, <laughs> the actress um, is being carried. Yeah. Um, her head dips into the water, which yep. I thought was hilarious because they then pretty good continuity because when she's dumped on the other side and she looks up, she does have the one lock that's been wet mm-hmm. by being dipped in the river. Um, so they paid attention, but anyway, so basically the dwarf just drops her there mm-hmm. and then goes to sit on his little stool watching everything. Cause that's what he does. And let's see how this and plays leave, out and leaves her to watch as he plays the one piece of actual classical music that you see in every horror film where someone plays a, an organ. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It says creepy. It says creepy. Yeah. Um, but he plays the whole piece, won't be interrupted. Once he's finished, then he's like, she, oh, she starts, she's like, there. excuse me. <laughs> 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 I'm not done yet. <laughs> and then he's like, I didn't see you there. <laughs> um, he here's the thing that I did. Thing like. out. He's got to stick to it. This is where he gets to talk to Christine mm-hmm. and tell her his sad story. He, Herbert Lom, clearly looked at the silent film. Yes. Um, which I liked because here with the mask on, so we don't see his mouth moving. This is a full face mask except mm. for the eye. Yeah. But he does the hand gestures. Yes. He does the same Lon Chaney hand gestures, which are very dramatic, which is why I, I was like, yeah, but sadly your character hasn't earned this kind of drama. That's the problem. Is like, is Lom is in, man. Give him something to do because Lom's there. Indeed. Lom's good. And I, I appreciated that. I was like, oh, that's a nice callback for anyone who is aware of it. And yeah. it's it's nice because it's what I want from the Phantom, which is a grandiosity. Mm-hmm. But essentially, he tells the story. And the story is, I'm a brilliant composer, but I was poor. So I went to Darcy uh, because he had connections. He a- could get actually, my Actually, he doesn't tell the story yet. He tells it when Harry shows up. Oh, okay. Oh, whoa. That's right. You're right. I'm sorry. Because here, here's where he says, I him. will teach you to sing. That's what yes. I will do. Uh, he says, I won't harm you. We'll work out a deal. You'll stay down here and yeah. I'll teach you to sing and you'll make a great debut. You, I will make you a star. But when you sing, you will sing for me. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? Oh, I'll know. Yeah. I'll be sitting down here watching through my little peephole. And going. And if you're singing for singing anyone singing for else, me. I don't know. Oh wait a minute, she's singing for somebody else tonight. I don't like this at all. That's I it, dwarf. Tell. Get up there, kill everybody. She's singing for her mother who's in the crowd. Kill her mother. <laughs> um. So that's Which right. Once again, Harry though, when the Phantom is saying you'll sing only for me, I can't not think of Andrew Lloyd Webber again. Sing, you know. Sing, sing for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's like, what I want. Yeah. Because, because, I, I don't because that. that's drama. That's with a capital D drama. Um, and yeah, that, that is, that is uh, Michael Crawford uh, saying, oh, man, wow, this is the best thing to ever happen to me since hello, Dolly <laughs> and condor man. My, my um, Crawford said, how edible is this scenery? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And that was the days before they'd really figured out like uh, those uh, discreet, you know, body mics. <laughs> Right. So that's why his makeup, he had, they had to actually incorporate that dangling microphone to the hair and wig. And, oh, I don't know. I had the book on the making of the musical, too, because <laughs> that's the kind of guy I am. Yep. Um, but um, so that's right. Harry uh, just, you know, knows that she's been taken mm-hmm. and he knows he knows where the Phantom's lair is now. He, he does the whole go in the river. Go under the grate. Well, he hasn't done that. He's not doing that just yet because we cut back to... Dude! <laughs> I'm sorry. I apparently have jumped way ahead. Darcy is trying to direct this new Va Va Voom actress who he's obviously right. doing on the side as well. Um, yeah. And she's not... Graphically. She's Hammer. Not, come on. Yeah. 1962. It's too soon for that. Who do, yeah. I mean, I was shocked. We saw all of Michael Goth, man. <laughs> Here's your X certificate, Britain censors. Make sure you get a good shot of my ass. Uh. <laughs> oh, God. 
Yes, sir, Mr. Wizzo. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. He's very proud of his behind, uh, Tom Wizzo. So, I, you know, Jeez. whatever. He, he works out. Oh, Tyler. He should have yeah. been called the ass. Because <laughs> that's all you see for 15 minutes. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's, he's trying to get her to sing. And then he says something to the conductor. And the conductor sasses him back hard. Mm-hmm. He gives him a little... I don't remember what it is. I just wrote he sasses him. I can't remember what he says. But he zings him pretty good here, the conductor. And then Goth is just like, that's it, you're fired. He's basically saying everyone's fired. Anyone yeah. who... Because uh, then all the musicians are upset. He's like, well, then you're all fired. The whole orchestra's fired. And finally... Finally, our little friend, the theater manager, Latimer, Latimer speaks up. He's like, "Going, you can't do that. I'm sorry, you just can't. So you need to hire back Harry and Christine and get over your goddamn self." Yeah, and then, and Darcy's never been spoken to like that. He's thrown. L- Latimer, um, by the way, Harry, I, I do, I do want to point out that Latimer is played by the wonderfully named Thorley Walters. It is a good name. What a great name that is. Uh, who will go on to be uh, Dr. Watson to Christopher Lee Sherlock Holmes. You know, you may want to let the listeners know, because they don't know that, but you, that is your actual birth name. But when you <laughs> went into the Screen Actors Guild and were told that there was already one, you changed to John Campbell, which yes. is a much a much more rare yeah, and unique name than no one's had before. Uh <laughs> But my name is Thorley. We we know, um, but that's already been taken. Thorley Walters. This is his first appearance in a Hammer movie. He will become a staple of these movies. This is a firm member of the Hammer repertory company here. So well, I liked him just fine. Yeah. It's just that it's, again, the the uh, the character. Oh yeah. Not what? Not much to do here, and doesn't make a lot of sense. Nope. Um, but obviously will go so far as to end up being Watson later on. So mm-hmm. he works his way up. Um, and I, Elementary, my dear Thor. It's been a while since I've watched those Christopher Lee Sherlock Holmes movies, but I remember them being good. So Yeah, it's been a while for me too. Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> Latimer says, uh, look, all right, you just fired everybody and uh harry harry comes in he's coming into the opera house as the entire orchestra's leaving he's like hey what's going on here and one of them is just like yeah we've all been fired and harry's just <laughs> like ha, ha, ha. oh i knew this place would fall apart without me uh, <laughs> so harry comes into darcy's office just as darcy is yelling at latimer about what he's gonna do here uh and latimer says you have one option you gotta bring harry back and Harry, of course, comes and he's like, well, I accept. We're getting kind of goofy. This is a little farcical, uh, this sort of thing here. It's all very like, <laughs> people have been murdered, but come on. It, it is weirdly inappropriate. I will say at this point, though, at this point, Harry doesn't know that Christine has been taken. So no, but things have not escalated for him yet. But people are dead. Yeah, people are dead. And, and we still don't know. He He's figured out who the Phantom is, but like. The Phantom could still be wreaking terror on this place. Yeah. Because they don't yet know that it's not the Phantom doing any of this. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, yeah. So, and then Harry does go, good job, Latimer. You actually stood up to him. And Latimer's like, well, I'm pretty proud of myself. Uh, so then, uh, then we cut to Harry's now directing the play as the producer. Uh, and he's telling yeah. you, you need to go over there. You need to go there. And somebody comes it in. This, it was at this moment I realized we had never been introduced to a director for the show. Nope. And it was at this moment I was like, are they meaning to tell us that Harry has been the producer and director all along? Producer, director, I do it all. Um, he uh, He's directing the show, and somebody comes up to him and whispers something in his ear, and he's like, what? He's like, if you'll excuse me, I have to go. And he runs over to Christine's apartment and, and then he's talking to the whatever the woman who runs the place or whatever the landlady or whatever she is. Uh, and uh, and it's like, yeah, we don't know. Her window's open and she's not here and she didn't take her coat or any of her things. And I never leave the window open. Yeah. I just, I, I don't do it. I don't want you laying that on my on me. I it just is don't the do one that thing ever. I am known for. It is never 
leaving the window open. I'm famous for it. <laughs> it says on my card. She yeah. pulls out a card. Oh, it does say right here, never leaves the never window leaves open. window open. All right, can't argue with that. It's in print. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so they're like, oh, no, well, where has she gone? And uh, then it cuts to Christine singing with the Phantom. That's another yep. good cut. We're like, where has she gone? Cut to her with the Phantom. Yep. And she's singing. And then it sort of is cross-cutting between her singing with the Phantom and Harry poking around trying to figure out where the Phantom's lair is. Um, although Let's he already see. should know where the answer is. <laughs> yeah. But he's trying... He's Well, he knows it's under the Opera House. So he's in the Opera House, like, poking around trying to find out if there's a secret way into the lair which there is but he doesn't find it which i found hilarious why even yeah. establish the secret entrance which is the like um the the stove the wood-burning stove pulls out and it goes downstairs but he never he finds find that. that so i'm like what no what, why introduce that nothing comes of that no nope. <laughs> it's just to say look you know you're gonna have to get into the river and you're gonna have to do that thing um i was pretty shocked here when the phantom slaps christine about three times because she's not that singing was, well and i was like jesus yeah. christ <laughs> well also you get the impression that she's been singing the same thing probably for about eight hours yeah and and he's about to faint and he's like again good again yeah. good again and better like, again could we take a single break <laughs> Back. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty hard. That is the one unstable thing. Where I was like, I would I mean, never hurt I anyone want... in the theater, but I will slap this lady. <laughs> yes. I'm no killer, but I sure like to beat a dame. Oh, that's terrible, Phantom. That's just so terrible. I will say, because uh, I mean, I was definitely in the sense we're supposed to have sympathy for this guy. I lost all sympathy once he starts smacking Christine around. And then he apologizes, though. He goes, I'm I'm sorry. Yes, of course. Get her some water. Take a break. Ooh, take a nap. I'm... That's the thing that always pisses me off in movies, like where a, a man, sla particularly old movies, a man slaps a woman. And he's just like, I'm sorry. My blood was just up. And you're like, Jesus, that does not play well. <laughs> Look, Whatever, I happens. just lost my cool for a second and hit this woman. Uh, yeah, man, we're, we're cool, right? No. We're, we're cool. Yeah. Oh, I get it. You were upset. Never mind. Yeah, it's just like, oh my god. <laughs> Thanks, it's my get out of jail free card. Great, thank you. But then after he slaps her, he's like, it's my music, my music, mine, damn it, duh! And he starts, he has a couple of these, what are meant to be like breaks with sanity, where he's like, it's mine, I tell yeah. you, mine, and I'll never, never get it from me. The key word is that he'll start doing a, a and this was where he did remind me of Chief Inspector Dreyfus, because um he does a good crazy guy which is a shame that herbert lom isn't given more of this to do in this movie but he Go full the keyword crazy. is scoundrel yeah. scoundrel is where he yeah. like scoundrel scoundrel he, and he does that a few times like yeah. Yeah, take my music it's mine it's mine it's scoundrel yeah and he says that a few times i'm like yeah i guess that's your that's the word you don't say around on uh petri but scoundrel I'm, oh scoundrel. Oh, that scoundrel now that you mention it, I'm thinking of that scoundrel. Um, <laughs> and it seems like this where you're like, he is so good that you're like, but I already know he doesn't kill anybody. So he's not a threat when he's doing this. I want to be know. afraid when he's doing this. Yeah. I want to be like, oh, my God, what's he going to do? Yep. Um, That's one thing this horror movie really lacked even a hint of dread or fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There. And I'm going to say, no, that's not a good because thing for the, a horror movie. the dwarf sidekick isn't scary. He, it's, it's no. throughout the whole movie even by the end of it i'm like who is this guy we saw him shove a dagger in a guy's eye but he never comes across as anything other than this kind of weirdly vacant yeah. childlike thing yeah. that never speaks because he can't <laughs> but he just sits there totally enwrapped by the music that that uh, petrie plays and then every now and then stabs a person in the eye socket yeah so anyway this is going on and uh now harry is out uh on the dock by the river there and uh he's he, in a van <laughs> down by the down river. by the river yeah he has to get past chris farley's matt foley character and then um <laughs> one of my all-time favorite snl things but i love matt foley, everyone's motivational speaker everyone's yeah it's so I'm sorry, Dad, i don't see real good is that bill shakespeare <laughs> sitting over there well lottie frick uh, you have a lot of time for living in a van down the river when you're living in a van 
down by the river. Uh, I was the cool kid in high school who had a living in the van down by the river shirt on. Uh, there you go. In the mid two thousands, a good 15, 16 years after that sketch had ended, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah. man, Chris Farley's the best." Uh, <laughs> I I can't not watch Black Sheep. Yeah. Hey, Beverly Hills Ninja. Ninja is his finest work. Oh, God. I loved Beverly Hills Ninja. I have not watched it in many no, years, but oh, no. yeah. Oh, high school me would have said, Beverly Hills Ninja is the funniest movie. Um, oh, man. Not ever, but I definitely would have been way into Farley movies at that point. It's okay. It's all right, man. It's have you okay. seen I mean, Almost Heroes? His chemistry with Matthew Perry is electric. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I bet their chemistry was good. Uh, it's that I did watch recently. Alcoholics and and drug users. Well, that, didn't, uh, did... that didn't go to screen. I'll say that from having watched it fairly recently. That movie is a snooze. Oh, yeah. Directed by Christopher Guest. Too. Wow. Yeah, really weird. Uh, apparently there were arguments with the studio though, so I don't know how much it is well, Christopher Guest happened. movie. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So he hears through that grate in the river. With a ru- with rushing water going around, he's like, "You did sound of of the organ playing." Well, he hears Christine's voice, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's like, "What's this?" And he dives into. I mean, look. Well, he gets in a little boat and pushes himself out to the grate, and then has to dive into the water. And we get a whole long scene of him swimming his way into the lair. It takes too long. This is eighty five minutes, yep. and yet this thing is dragging. Um, yeah. So. Uh, d- yeah, he goes to the river drain, and then the Phantom hears the footsteps of Harry approaching. He's like, they'll never get it. They'll never get my music. He starts tearing up all of his sheet music. That's right. You come, scoundrel. Come on. Uh, Kendra. Yeah. Kendra. Anyway, so he's doing that. He's a crazy guy. Uh, anyway, the Phantom's crazy. Harry. Yeah. Uh, so Harry does find the lair, but... What what he doesn't know is that the the I, I do love the the sidekick guy just putting Christine in her bed. He puts her there, <laughs> and he's like, "I'll handle these intruders." He doesn't say anything because he's a mute. But he gets his little makeshift snorkel out. Yep, <laughs> it goes. In it's the water. adorable. I love that. I love that so much. It is, it's and he puts on his little water wings. It's just it's really cute. He's got it's so adorable. And he's <laughs> <laughs> there. He goes to the water. <laughs> takes to the water like a fish uh look at him go a mute fish yeah. well fish are okay shut up <laughs> look i'm a burnt man living in the sewers all right i haven't kept up with all the info uh about fish yes uh i'm getting to it uh so <laughs> we see uh harry going through the water and out of, out of nowhere here comes sidekick dwarf with a knife and these two struggle and fight and it's pretty lame yeah it's not uh not too exciting no as much as you would think a sidekick dwarf exploding out of the water with a knife would be the thrill of a lifetime it's yeah really... they had done some slow-mo of him coming up like like jason and one of the friday the 13th yeah movies. Ooh, we could have used jason Voorhees in this movie uh we could have used body count would have gone way up <laughs> but oh no my one god was if the phantom sex. sidekick was jason Voorhees, holy shit but no one was, was uh smoking pot or having sex so uh, um well michael goth no, was no one... oh yeah it's true uh, we don't see any we we know he was having sex i'm gonna go ahead and assume he's smoking a little reefer while he's at it too well it's not like he has to preserve his uh his creativity for actually making any music so yeah he probably just gets stoned another goth line i'd like to see excuse me dear would you mind if i light up this doob (laughs) don't bogart that bong (laughs) that Uh, was i think very convincing drug talk for me yeah i'm very proud of don't bogart that bong man uh You're harshing my buzz here. Um. That is some kind bud. <laughs> Ooh, it's some real sticky icky. Um. Ask me the sticky icky. And now this is the part of the podcast where two men who don't do drugs attempt to talk about drugs. Uh. That makes it funnier, I think. Isn't it funnier? Yeah. 
<laughs> two totally like when straight edge dudes. <laughs> As a celibate person talking about sex, it's equally funny. <laughs> what? I and know. then I think they totally do it. Yeah, they they totally do it. Uh, <laughs> with the, the I think this is the part of the movie where they get it on. Yeah, but we don't see it. You know, like how people do it. Um, yeah, on. <laughs> <laughs> Goes back to Freaks and Geeks, man. One of the best lines ever. I hear she fornicates it. <laughs> uh, now uh, I have to watch Freaks and Geeks again. It, it just showed up on Hulu, so. Uh, oh, I don't have Hulu. Oh uh, well, it's it's. But great. I've got the box set. Oh well, then then don't fire you. that thing up because it's I will, brilliant. I will fire it up. Uh, all right. So yeah. Uh, so anyway, Harry pretty easily defeats this dwarf. Uh. And just drags him back into the lair. And he's just like, Petrie! <laughs> and he Did you lose your little toy? <laughs> and he drops the... Un this is actually a somewhat badass moment for Harry where he just drops the unconscious dwarf on the ground. Yeah, it is good. And he's like, yeah, I saw him coming and kicked the shit out of him. Um, yeah, once I got the knife away from dwarf. him, he went down pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> In fact, it was embarrassing how fast he went down. Uh, <laughs> uh, where was this? You know, a real fan of his own killing. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I was like, ooh, I'm waiting for it. When he comes in here and he's like, Petrie! I'm like, oh, now it's on. Nope. It's not on. Nope. These two are going to talk. Uh, this is the weakest little bit because this is where we finally get to yeah. uh, the flashback to the events that the guy – he had talked to at the printing place has already told him yeah now we just see it uh because now we just see it because the the phantom's like how do you know who i am and he's like i know not only do i know who you are i know you were the one who wrote the opera and he's like yes mm -hmm. let me tell you my tale and then he tells the tale and we don't really need to go into it because what everything we talked about earlier we just see i will say Goff is another he, he oh, does oh. some great assholery in yes. the flashback. My favorite moment is when he smacks him upside the head with a walking stick. Mm hmm I like the scene where he yells at the guy uh, oh. who takes care of his, his carriage because yeah. there's dirt on it. Yeah. You expect me to be seen, be seen in, in, in a carriage that looks like this. Do it again. Do it over. <laughs> yes, my lord. Once again, Goth is having a field day with this part. Uh um, Petrie sells his work for 50 pounds. Yeah. Which is where he even says it's like, it's this many concertos, a blah, 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 a full chamber piece blah, 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 yeah. and an entire opera, which means all of Darcy's known works. Yeah. He's been living off this guy's work for a couple of years now, but I love, it's so cheesy. Oh, I, think I love I the going second that Petrie walks out. Yep. And he looks at the music and it's like St. Joan, an opera by uh Bubba by Petrie. And and Goff just crosses out Petrie's name and writes his name underneath. Because that's all you gotta do. Uh, yeah, I love that. I used, to do like, that. I used to do that in libraries a lot. Gone with the Wind by Margaret No nope. <laughs> Brendan Jones. I was like, whatever, I just wrote to kill a mockingbird. It it, it was it wasn't Harper Lee, it was me. People pick that Boom. up in the library and go I didn't know Brendan wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> yeah, he wrote Great Gatsby, that's, too. Uh, that's all you have to do. Bonfire of the Vanities by Brendan Jones. Brendan, when did you write Bonfire of the Vanities? Oh, a few years back. High school. Yeah. I was feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I, I laughed so hard at that when he's just like, and writes in his own name. Yep. So, uh, yeah, but basically the whole thing is Petrie's like, you can't do that. And Goff's like, yeah, I can. I gave you money. I bought your work. It's yeah. now my work. And yeah. he's like, what? You mean, well, I'll stop you. Mean you mean my music. He does one of the. Yeah. So uh, basically Petrie <laughs> goes to the printer. The printer's <laughs> like, I can't do anything about it. The um, like, that's all, all I do is print things. I have I nothing to do with the right. <laughs> Whatever. I'm just, I'm just a man just who print prints what I'm told. Like. I just printed out a novel called The Executioner's Song by Brendan Jones. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know. I would I just, say that whatever. was your boldest work, my friend. Uh, Executioner's Song. Longest. Yeah. Long. 
But, um, but, <laughs> but then he sneaks in, at, like the guy had said, he sneaks in after the place is closed and he's scooping up the prints, the, the plates and the the work and he's throwing it all in the The one thing that we uh, so he's throwing the I guess we find out how he starts the fire is a new piece of information. We just knew a fire started. So he's throwing all the prints of the music into the fire and then some like drapes catch fire or something or Well for some reason there's some sort of well, I guess paper scraps or something is on the floor. Right. And he doesn't close the, the blast <laughs> no. furnace's door while he's chucking stuff in. So while he goes back to grab more stuff, flames have leapt out of yeah. the, the burning. Well, but then thing. he's also using the acid to destroy the plates. Well, yeah, there's that. Uh but that's the why fire he has the starts acid. on the So he know this is the thing that got me though. He knows it's acid. He knows it's acid. And still yeah, throws but it he the still fire. Throws it on the yeah. So I have no sympathy. This man did this a hundred percent to himself. But also here's the thing. You you remember the Universal movie is not good. I yes. mean it's not great. No. I thought that the origin sequence in that was well shot and the makeup was good. Mm -hmm. And I liked uh, Claude Rains plays the fuck out of him being burned alive by acid. I, I, have have I he, seen better acid to face acting? I do not think so. Uh when he runs out in the street, there's literally like smoke coming off of him yeah. and his clothes are burning as well. This movie, they did for a movie where half the people have believed that a man died in a fire. Mm -hmm. And even the cop that gets interviewed says, or is like, no, someone was badly burned, but you know, no one died in the fire. This guy, it just looks like a guy runs out of the place with his hands on his face. Yeah, I know, and especially for Hammer, who who's there, they're going into the gore, they're making it dark and twisted. When you see the makeup later, the makeup's pretty good, but yeah. you're like, well, why can't they at least do the like he's smoking as he runs out, mm -hmm. or part of his clothes have been eaten away, something like that. But yeah. instead, you just see a guy running out, going, ah, I want, Nicholson and then he jumps in Batman when he's got his hand over his face and there's blood coming between his fingers and stuff or something like that. All I want is yeah. for him to look at a mirror and then smash it and mirror. start laughing. Mirror! I do... There, I have problems with that first Burton Batman, but that sequence of just... Mirror. Oh. <laughs> and he just starts laughing. And like, you see what you I have to work with? see the tools I have to work with. Oh, my God. It's the best, man. And the, just the swinging bulb on mm -hmm. the... Oh. That was really well done sequence. That yeah. is a nicely done... Anyway... Yeah. So this wasn't. Anyway, so we get the, <laughs> the uh, flashback. Petrie is yeah. like, yeah, so that's the story. And then this is the weakest thing. It's just so weak. Here it is basically him saying, that's my story. I'm not a murderer, but my work was stolen. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is train Christine. I'm not stealing her away. I want to train her for a couple of weeks. She'll make a debut. She'll be amazing. And my work will be, you know, uh, I, it'll get all the... He does say this, but before this, I just want to mention the thing about, this is where he's asked about, well, who's this guy? Oh, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know yeah, who yeah, he yeah. is. I don't know okay. what he wants. Um, yeah, the, he, you know, he's like, well, what about this little, <laughs> this mute hunchback guy yeah. that I just fought? Who I like, easily you know defeated in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, I don't know anything about him, yeah. and he can't speak. I don't even know his name. Yeah. But he saved my life yeah. when I came down here, and he has helped me ever since. And you're like, okay. He saved my life, so I'm looking the other way on the murders. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's best not to ask. Yeah. He likes my music. That's the important Yeah. Thing. So what? He stabs a rat catcher in the eye. It happens. <laughs> but uh, this whole thing of him going, look, that's my that's my plan, and what about it? What do you think? And Christine looks at Harry as like, I don't think it's that bad of an idea. And Harry's like, well, if you don't think it's that bad of an idea, okay. And then it just... This has never been a part of any uh, <laughs> no, Phantom of the Opera no. story. They went, you know what? Okay. And honestly, it's not that bad an idea because this guy is not a threat in any way to anyone. Like, You know what? I'm not going to live down here. Why does he even here? need just... to be ostracized from society? <laughs> I know. He could have gone. He could have gone public the second he came out of the sewer and said, "All right, there was a terrible accident that I got burned, but here's yeah. why I got burned, and yeah. you need to know about Goff's character and, and Darcy." Everything we know about Darcy, everyone will believe it. <laughs> Known yeah. and asshole. the fact that 
and apparently he has left convincing original works of his back yeah. at the joint he yeah. lived at that could easily prove that it matched stuff that Darcy supposedly has and still hasn't published. No, yeah, all this could have been avoided. All, all he wants to do is train Christine to sing, see her sing, and then I guess return to the sewers. Well, no, he also says, "I'm dying." Oh, which is another weird thing. He goes, "I don't have long." Yeah. What you can see, you can see that. Look, I mean, well, but that's uh, just the burns. That's not. He also is diseased somehow. I know. I was thrown by that line. Yeah, you can you're see like, I'm oh, dying. Okay. I'm like, I thought that was from the acid. All right, whatever, buddy. Oh no, no, the acid. That's this is a whole other disease. He's, he's working on the big sympathy thing. So a weird twist in Phantom of the Opera is Christine and her her boyfriend Harry going, yeah. okay. And then it just cuts to opening night, and presumably he's trained her, and she's ready to go. Yep. <laughs> and we get to see. I couldn't believe that cut. Uh, we finally get to see more of this great opera. Well, <laughs> before before the opera starts, he goes to Darcy's op. Darcy comes into his office, and the Phantom is there, and he's like, "Hello, Darcy," and it's like, "Who are you? What is the meaning of this?" And he's like, you stole my work, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking, oh, this is it. This is where he's going to just slash Michael Goss' throat open or something or throw him out a window or or something. I'm ready for this. Instead, Goth goes, take that stupid mask off and takes it off. And we don't see it. But Goth is just like, oh, my God. And then he faints. And the Phantom just picks up his mask and sort of has a like, well, I got the better of that interaction and leaves. And that's the last of Goth in the movie. That's bullshit, man. I couldn't believe this. The one guy he wants vengeance on, he just gives a small fright to, and then yeah. is like, well, done and done. Vengeance done. Yeah. I mean, that'd be like, uh, you know, you having an arch nemesis, and then when you finally catch him, you show him some really gross, like, um, YouTube uh, traffic <laughs> accident kind of videos. And you're like, oh, God, that's terrible. It's like, yeah. Take that, and then you walking out. Yeah, good luck getting that out That's of your head. Your revenge huh? is showing him faces of death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He showed him faces of death. Yeah, he's not gonna forget that anytime no. soon. Yeah, but is that really revenge? Um, <laughs> yeah. Let me get back to you on that. I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I just Goss, want to do something he won't forget. <laughs> we want to see Darcy get it. We want. He's to the see only some... character in the movie you really want to see die. He deserves it more than a rat catcher and more yeah. than a stage hand. Yeah, actually, the um, people who do get killed really don't. I mean, the rat catcher isn't bad in any way. That stage hand didn't do anything. Nope. Just that we of, saw. Yeah. <laughs> oh, off screen, he was a monster. <laughs> Jokes on so you. That that's man is right. a known animal rapist. Uh, that was so like uh unsatisfying that i nearly forgot entirely that's how goth's character gets written out <laughs> what? Uh, because we have more exciting things to deal with john like, we're about to see more of saint joan oh god it's so bad but what's what's funny is um, so bad because we can see more of it but it's still just the same two scenes yeah so the composer had only like okay all i have to deal with oh that's not true uh, we deal with the we get, first we get scene. One with the more English. scene. Yes, there's the English people, uh, the English uh, soldiers, and the French villagers. Then we get the innocent young Joan singing to the heavens. Then we do get a very brief. You've been condemned as a heretic. Uh, you're going to be burned at the stake. I think, I think so that might actually be up. the worst of them too. The lyrics in that are atrocious. Oh wait, no. Actually, we actually do get. Um, heroic joan in armor also yes so they do there are, that's really there short are. though we just sort of see her grabbing her sword and like leading some men yeah there's oh, not man. much there it, 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 you know i know that when you you're creating fake whatever for a, a movie like it has to yeah. be a fake song or in this case yeah. a fake musical or opera well, we know they're not going to be but maybe don't do and- a fake opera you know that Jesus. a fake song is one thing a fake opera that's a big ass like, you are condemned as a heretic. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, uh, it is. It is like I said. It is. It is a total first draft of a like. Yeah, I guess this is an opera. I will say that Heather Sears, I guess, mm-hmm. who is Christine, mm-hmm. she does a very good job of lip syncing to the actual singer. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Who, who, whoever does her operatic singing voice, Heather Sears does a pretty convincing job of mouthing along. I was like, wow, good. That it's almost convincing. It's the best part of. Her uh, voice. So that's the end of the musical. The well, Phantom has watched it. The be- The best no. part is is before or just as she comes on stage to sing her first song, she looks up at the Phantom, and he yeah. like clutches his heart, and he's like, Yeah, well, no, he right had here. he had shown her he had shown her as training. This is where you sing from. That's what I mean. That's so, what I'm saying. He clutches yeah. his heart like sing yes, from the like, heart. Remember, the heart. and she kind of and gives she, a like nod of like yes. Like, yeah, I got it. And so just then, watch what I'm about to then do. we see all the scenes from the opera and then everyone is applauding and cheering and they, the crowd loves it. And it cuts to the phantom who's crying. He's, he's crying. Oh God. Oh God. Do you think I didn't lose it right then? I lost it. <laughs> I didn't lose it, but it was still, and they all loved it. it. Was, they're all like, yes, it's a triumph. Yeah. Blah, yeah. Blah. yeah. Um, and meanwhile, also watching this play is the dwarf sidekick from above. And he's like, Fuck this play. <laughs> he finally speaks. His one line of dialogue. Fuck this play. He, I mean, it sounded good in rehearsal down there. This is bullshit. I really? have, we have no idea who this guy is. We have no idea what he wants. I have yep. no idea what motivates him to bring this nope. chandelier down. No. Nope. But he's just like, well, nobody's died in a while chandelier it, it is kind of what that reads like is he just goes well i guess people are expecting this right well because i'm watching i guess i have to drop a chandelier i'm watching all right. this going all right what's gonna happen to make the phantom lose it because i'm thinking this has got to be the end of the movie it can't just end with the play going well something's i i was waiting for goth to come back and like bring the police for him and they have to chase the phantom away and he gets killed or something like that. In the Phantom of the Opera story, the falling of the chandelier is a, I mean, it's an iconic thing. It, yeah. it, it just, you expect it. Yeah. The things that we know about the, the dropping of the chandelier is it's one of the major acts of the phantom mm-hmm. and it is something he does. Oh, absolutely. It's his choice yeah. because he has been so enraged. This is his big gesture multiple people are killed I was say, because it's mass least, murder yeah at least in the case of the of the paris opera house and not this this place that's a massive chandelier mm-hmm. um that's a huge house and you probably didn't get a lot of like in the universal movie he's up there for like 20 minutes sawing <laughs> away but, that, he really struggled to get that thing down so people had plenty of time to notice and get out of the way. Yeah. But in the book, it, it's meant that literally maybe a dozen or more people were crushed under this huge crystal chandelier. Yeah. And this thing, the chandelier is maybe eight feet across. It's made of wood. It has yeah. it has candles in it's it. It's on the stage. Essentially. Yeah. And um and so it's a weird story choice because the chandelier is not what closes out Phantom of the Opera. No, no. But in the case of this story, he's like this is how it wraps up. People have been waiting for it. Here it is. It's instead the dwarf doing it for unknown reasons. <laughs> Harry sees that happening because it's going to come down on Christine. Yeah. Uh, and she doesn't know or she's unaware. So Harry's moving like, oh, my God, Christine, he's going to try and stop it, but he's going to be too slow. So the Phantom, this is where it just like it pisses me off. The Phantom is now the hero. He gets there in time. Yeah to shove Christine out of the way mm-hmm. and the chandelier crushes him. Yep. And we see him laying dead there and it cuts to the dwarf sidekick looking down from above being like, well, that's not what I meant to happen. Oh shit. <laughs> oh man. I didn't, who's going to play that organ. I hauled down into the cellars. <laughs> yeah. And he, nothing, by the way, nothing happens to him. Nothing happens to him. And, you know, this is where we get, you know, we've had the reveal of the makeup now. And you're yeah. like, well, that's pretty good makeup. I'm glad we waited to the last yeah. second. Well, because before it. he runs to save Christine, he ditches the mask. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't know why, but he does. Well, I know why. It, because it only slow him down. <laughs> <laughs> I know why. Time because we everything. see him dead. Everybody's looking at him dead under the chandelier. And then the camera pans over to the mask laying on the floor as mm-hmm. credits roll. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh this is weak sauce. It's a it's a bad take on the material and a this bad is, end. This is not even we can't even this is a straight not recommend at all. 
absolutely no. don't watch this. I'm usually the guy who says, well, there's a thing or two. No. no. Unless you're a Herbert Lom completist. Yeah. <laughs> which and I wouldn't fall for. I love Herbert Lom. He's great. He's great. And he's good in it. Herbert Lom's good here. If you're a but Michael this- Goth completist, holy God, this is a gift uh, for the Goth scenes. Just watch the Goth scenes because good Lord. Can, can I say that uh, the dwarf is played by Ian Wilson? Mm-hmm. And looking at his IMDb, we get an Avengers appearance, Ooh. as we always must. And most importantly, he will have a chance to be with one of the stars of Hammer, one of the greats. Uh, he is in The Wicker Man in 1973. Oh, with our wow. Friend. Not, he has a part as the communicant, which I mean, I doubt he has any dialogue. But, you know, I love The Wicker Man. Great it's movie. not a Hammer film, but highly recommend The Wicker Man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a great Christopher Lee, certainly, in that. Uh, yeah, it's a great Christopher Lee movie, and one of the, just, it's one of those, you can't really oh, describe yeah. it. I'm looking at Ingrid Pitt as well, another uh, Hammer alum uh, in mm-hmm. as well. Oh, yeah, Ingrid Pitt in, in The Wicker Man. Yeah. Very sexy. And, of course, Very... the great Edward Woodward. Anyway, yeah. watch The Wicker Man. That's a good movie. Don't watch this. Yeah, um, that uh, this isn't good, and it is the first real... Stinkeroo. I l- yeah. still like a lot of Curse of the Werewolf. This is just not good. As I said, like the second half of Curse of the Werewolf is totally fine. This, this is just bad. This is really bad. So that's a big no recommend from John and I. But yeah. next week we're going on to a movie I don't think I've ever seen. I know I haven't seen it. So we're going to Kiss of the Vampire. Not a Dracula film. Not but a Dracula it's a Hammer- film. Not a Van Helsing movie. Not a Van Helsing movie, but it is a Hammer vampire film. Yes, um, and it's not one of their their sexy lesbian vampire movies. Not, We're not only to that. have I not seen this, I don't really know anything about it even. Which makes me highly curious. But I was able to track down a copy. I know how I will be watching it. So yeah, it's another one in uh, that box set that I mentioned. That's just nicely there. done. Yeah. So that's uh that's next on the list. It's a big question mark. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to it simply because. I don't know what to expect. No, I yeah, that's it exactly. We can't it can't disappoint per se because I have no expectations because I don't know what I'm about to watch. Uh, nice. So anyway, Kiss of the Vampire next week on the show. Don't watch Family Opera. Those are the takeaways from this episode. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but uh, that's uh, that's gonna wrap things up. Uh, if you, uh, oh, well, I should mention if you're listening to this on Patreon, thank for thank you for your uh, support there. Uh, and if you're not, if you're listening to this for, for free, you should go over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash panel up, where you can get uh, whole chunks of this show uh, well mm. in advance of what's coming out on the free feed. So, You know what I like best about the show are the chunky parts. Is yeah. Those chunks you're talking about. Those are it's, The rest of it's kind of a good thin we soup. We advertise like as the chunk. chunkiest podcast available. So, uh. Sadly, that's mainly due to my physical appearance, <laughs> and I think that's insensitive, and I... I'm very angry. Oh, no. All right. We're going to have to hash this out for a bit of the, over the next week and see if you come back next week. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters. I'm John Campbell. I'm Brendan Jones. And remember, there are such things as monsters. Not this week. Not this week. Not a single monster. Not even a main villain who acts like a monster. Weak sauce. <laughs>